Welcome to episode 12 of Shame Talks. Uh, as you've noticed recently, I was given a lot of really good Sun King beers to drink on the show. So Jason and I decided tonight that we were going to go with the Grand Muckle to drink. It is a uh, wee heavy that is then aged in cinnamon whiskey barrels. Uh, Sun King's normal wee heavy is wee Mac, and I'm not the biggest fan of it. I think it's just okay. Um, so I was really kind of curious to see what the cinnamon whiskey barrel would do to it. And I really I enjoy the flavor that it adds to it. It... um. Yeah, it, it smooths out the wee heavy part of it a lot, and then uh, that cinnamon kicks in in the end. Uh, so, really enjoyable beer, and I'm glad that we're going to be drinking it today. Tonight's episode was actually the brainchild of Jason Richardson. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it looks like it was August 3rd, Jason put up a post just saying he was bored and wanted to talk about his top 10 favorite directors and see if anybody would have a discussion with him. And it blew up into a huge discussion, uh, and when it blew up like that, I thought this would be a, a great a great episode until we just did the top 10 favorite films let's do top 10 directors now uh so jason this this episode is your brainchild and i'm gonna have you uh start us off give us give us your top 10 directors list well thank you for making this happen man so so i've got a top three and then the rest is no special order so um but by far i'd say my favorite director is, is david fincher and I did not jump on the fin a Fincher wagon with um, Fight Club. Um, it was actually Social Network that oh. really drew me into David Fincher, followed by the uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo remake. I thought it was brilliant, and it was just a beautiful film to, to, to watch. But he's my all-time favorite director. So neither Seven or Fight Club brought you into the Fincher world? Love those, love those films, but I kind of emotionally got attached to social network and, okay. and and dragon tattoo but i love the game i love gone yep. girl fight club i love he helped create the the remake of house of cards for netflix which oh, started okay. a whole new binge tra uh, thing so so yeah but i was i liked fight club but i wasn't on that bandwagon like a lot of we people were and it took social network to really like oh this guy is really good nice so um second would be steven spielberg all right. who's probably on most people's lists jaws et close encounters color purple jurassic park all epic films schindler's list everybody loves steven spielberg so yep. the, he he was bound to be in the top three number three john carpenter halloween 1978 alone my mm -hmm. favorite film of all time i don't think there's any director's with as much creative vision into a film than John, John Carpenter, especially on a very low budget. It was so effective for the low budget that it had that it just came across as real. And I don't think anyone has ever tapped or be able to recreate that, uh, especially on a low budget. So sure. uh, Halloween, except for New York, Escape from New York, I love The Fog, Starman. Um, the rest of the directors, were, and again, no special order, Ridley Scott, Alien, Gladiator, The Martian, American Gangster, uh, probably one of the few that likes Prometheus. Oh, um, one I know will not be on anyone's list, Adrian Lyne uh, did Flashdance. And if you were born at that time or around that time where you saw that in theaters, that was life. I mean, everybody was about flash dance. Well, and Fatal when, Attraction. When, when I saw your list, that was the one director that I had to look up because the name didn't ring a bell with me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was upset. Not, not upset, but I was like, oh, he has a very good body of work because Jacob's Ladder is one of my favorite films yep. like in that horror genre. Uh, Jacob's Ladder and then Indecent Proposal, Fatal Attraction, and Lolita are all are all yep. movies that i like all of those and i had no, i had no idea this guy directed them all and one that i think is kind of subtle quiet and a lot of people don't talk about it but i think dave lichty and i have talked about this is uh unfaithful with diane lane and richard oh, okay. Gere. if you've not seen that movie it is amazing it's beautiful to watch and there's a there's a uh it, it, it takes you down one road and all of a sudden just jerks you another way and but just just watching the acting and the direction, everything is just beautiful about that movie, even though there's got a weird turn twist to it. Um, but have a lot of respect uh, for Adrian Lyne, and, and he seems to have a... Uh, uh, a lot of his movies deal with uh, a female, and he's, he's good at capturing the female essence on screen, and 
and sexuality and, and kind of thriller and, and a dark tone. And I, I like that a lot. Um, Clint Eastwood, I think, is a brilliant director. Um, Bridges of Madison County played Misty for me. Unforgiven, Million Dollar Baby, American Sniper, a few of the Dirty Harry movies. Um, Alfred Hitchcock, genius, but yep. he's kind of twisted in the head. Uh, <laughs> Rear Window, by far one of my all-time favorite movies. I could watch it anytime I see it on TV. Rope, Psycho, who doesn't love Psycho? Yeah. Uh, Quentin Tarantino is uh, he is so good at what he does I don't like all of his movies and they're very hard to sit through and watch but I love him for the fact that he loves movies and when you watch a Quentin Tarantino movie uh, even if you don't like the movie you like his creativity and he puts that it just exuberates from his movies that he loves movies. And I love his little things that he puts in that it's kind of like a throwback to like the seventies cinema and, oh, sure. and such with the scratches and stuff in the screen and the, the movie, like, you know, what's the thing with the, the, the film it catches on fire and the burn melts. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Like... Yeah. Yeah. I love just those little subtle things that he, that he puts into his films. He's, He's very good at that, and so I have a lot of respect uh, for him with that. But I would say, with his, I really liked Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The ending just blew me away. Uh, Pulp Fiction, and I'm probably one of the few that really loved Jackie Brown, even though that's not uh, a movie written by him. Right, that's but my Jackie least Brown, favorite. Jackie Brown is, is one I just love jumping into that story and watching those characters. Uh, my last two, I would say John Hughes, Breakfast Club, 16 Candles, Uncle Buck, Plane, Trains, and Automobiles. That was just my youth and my gro my young teen period, and I was just all about that um, in the '80s. And then my last director would be Spike Lee. Um, I think that "Do the Right Thing" is an amazing, amazing film, and remember seeing it. Uh, I think it was about 15, and I went twice during the summer in Chicago to watch the film just due to its message, it really resonated with me and, and the film blew me away. So that's my top 10. Uh, I, I will say do the right thing is Spike Lee's best film. Um, my, my only ever complaint with Spike Lee is the fact that I love 90% of Spike Lee movies. And the 10% I don't like is the last 10 minutes of every one of his movies. <laughs> I hate when, I hate when the riot happens and radio Raheem dies. Uh, the last 10 minutes of the 25th hour where it's like, Oh, did he really go to jail or did he really escape? Like right. it always seems like he, I, I, I love his stories and, and everything is so good. And then that last 10 minutes, he, now that he's trying to do a Shyamalan, but he wants to throw some curveball at you and do something that you didn't see coming and that's just where he loses me because, again, like I said, I hate the riot and I hate Radio Raheem dying at the end to do the right thing. Um, yeah, that's my you know, he's, complaint with Spike Lee. You know he, but, what Spike Lee is good at is um, those moments where he's drawing you into the character, where he's doing something with the camera where it looks like the, the character's gliding. Oh, sure. It, 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 they're, they're walking, but they're not walking. They're kind of floating. And it's a camera trick that he does that I think is is amazing, and that's kind of like his signature, his stamp, on in his movies. That you know, oh, oh, that's a that's a Spike Lee movie. So, Mayor, what about you, Jay? What do you think? You haven't really chimed in on the on the list. Um, Spike Lee with uh, I I'd, I'd agree with Shane for the most part. Like he he's actually in my top ten, and it's because he gets really good performances out of everybody, and um. But like that last little bit is always that moment of, of like who who dies at uh, the end of he got game? I can't remember the last. He didn't one. die. He no. didn't die. He throws the basketball from like he's in like the uh, his son throws the basketball and it ends up in the prison even though he's in the middle of the city. Oh okay yeah yeah. yeah. And then it, like and then he gets that's the a ball metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, like, it's it's one of those things where, like, maybe it's just him trying to, like, make sure every movie is a is a, a think em kind of moment oh, at yeah. the end where he's like, yeah. I'm going to make you think about this. And Spike it might does not you want you it, to come but... out with basically everything handed on a plate. He wants you to sit there and think and debate 
and I think he throws he does that purposely in his films. And and, and I but I will agree with Shane. Like Twenty uh, Fifth Hour is actually my favorite that he didn't write that he's directed. Mm. Um, That's Edward that, Norton, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like that one a lot. And then my favorite that he has written, he wrote was He Got Game. Um, I just thought the dynamics between Ray, Ray Allen, who never acted again or before that, uh, uh, worked really well with Denzel Washington. And oh, sure. um, that, yeah, like that, that movie really connected with me. Um, from the like the father son aspect of just yeah like that movie was just so well done um i i, I know we have other lists to get to but i'm just kind of curious because again it is the the oddball of all the names that i've listed and, and i don't think anyone else has picked this i'm curious jason adrian line i know you're very particular about films but do any of those films of adrian line resonate with you uh, I, I to tell you the truth i i'm in the same boat shane was in where like i read that name and i was like who and then I looked it up and I was like, oh my goodness, like every single one of these, um, I don't think that they they struck me, but I think all of them are really good movies that I've seen on that are directed by him. Like, but yeah, I, I, I it's been a long time since I've seen anything of his and, and obviously taste change when you're an adult compared to when you're, you know, you're in your twenties or earlier. Um, See, that's one of the reasons why, like, John Hughes didn't make my list was because I never felt like, while there were great movies, I never felt like he, I don't know if it was great because of the fact that they were, they resonated with me when I was younger so much more. I mean, don't get me wrong, I still love Breakfast Club and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but, like, as far as, like, the directing of it, I'm not sure if it worked for me that he took it to a, like another level. Like, I feel like almost anybody could have probably gotten the performances that they got uh, out of But, his, but of it was movies. something about his name tagged on movies. There, oh, was a stre- there was a stretch for a while. And in the eighties, it was like, he was just banging them out. And it was like, John oh, Hughes, was. John Hughes, John Hughes. And they just had this stamp on it, uh, the stamp of the eighties. And for some reason, it, it just, everybody was talking about it. Everyone, loved the movies and it was just the big thing and and so while his movies are pretty basic uh, basically i think a lot of a lot of people could relate to those characters even at that time absolutely uh, and, and so it's kind of like you know what give it to him so uh, and and you know that's that's kind of where i feel like i feel like him and kevin smith are very similar for me personally from an aspect of their movies might not have been the best movies but they made impacts on me um and um kevin smith definitely has some duds in there uh with a couple of his films but like but who does my top 10. sure but yeah who doesn't i mean spielberg's got bfg right so yeah <laughs> but beautiful to watch though beautiful i've Spielberg never seen also it, got, so. what was it piranha 2 was his first movie he ever made james cameron <laughs> Oh, was that James Cameron? Uh, James Cameron uh, did Piranha too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you guys. No, dude. The, number one, thank you for coming up with this idea. Uh, it gave me the idea to make it into a podcast. You have a great list. I can't argue with any of them. Uh, Adrian Lyon wouldn't be on my list, but again, everything he's done, I've liked. So I, I don't yeah. see any reason why he shouldn't be on your list. Um, all right. So remember, gonna... I'm older than you. So. <laughs> we are going to move on to Jason L. Miller, who I believe is a friend of yours, uh, Richardson. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, he, yes. he was somebody that, that I am not familiar with. And when I looked at our mutual friends, you were, you were our only mutual friend. So, okay. uh, Jason Miller has John Hughes, who we just talked a lot about, uh, Martin Scorsese, Christopher Nolan, Stanley Kubrick, Steven Spielberg, which I, uh, spoiler alert now, Steven Spielberg is on a lot of these lists. Uh, yeah, Richardson, you were right about that fact. Uh, He also has Fincher on there. Alfred Hitchcock is also on there. I was really happy to see Wes Craven show up on this list. Uh, He also has Quentin Tarantino like you did. And then he threw on Tim Burton, which which I know a lot of people love Tim Burton. Um, Of that list, is there anything that stands out to any of you guys that uh, that we haven't talked about yet or that you're surprised is on a list? I'm not surprised, but I mean, I'm glad to hear, and I knew somebody was going to throw it in, would be Kubrick. Yep. 
And again, you know, he's got a handful of movies. I have yet to to the, this date to see 2001. Oh, wow. I've okay. never seen that movie. Uh, and I will I at either. some point, someday. Um, I would kind of like to see it on the big screen, like an IMAX or something, that to really kind of yeah, dive into that. It, yeah. it just seems like one of those types of movies. Um, but um, how can you not appreciate The Shining? Oh, for sure. Yep. Uh, jumping back, the one thing I will say about 2001 is just completely lower your expectations. Um, it's it's not an amazing film, but it also like when you break it down and the story that he was trying to tell and like the evolution of humanity and mankind and how we how we end up in outer space and where we came from is like a whole circular storyline that he's trying to tell. It's it's good on a on a on a different level, but it is a very slow and a very boring movie. But it's a think but, piece. But back then in the seventies, would that have been visually incredible to watch? Yes, a hundred percent. It looks really good. Um, there's a lot a lot of the space scenes look really well. Um, it's I I understand why it's huge, but uh, I think I was I would have been eighteen or nineteen when I watched it for the first time. And I, I watched it because it had been built up so much. And I remember I remember being very bored, but it does look very good. So since neither of you guys have seen it, I just want to lower your expectations that when you do finally sit down to watch it, don't expect something amazing. There's literally like a 20-minute sequence where there's no dialogue whatsoever. It's all visual. Like, it, it's a very slow and dull movie, but the story that it tells is, is, is worth watching once. It's not going to be something that you're going to fall in love with and want to watch it every day or anything, but like, I appreciate what he did with it, even though I don't really care for the movie. Um, I would say that Wes Craven, um, uh, and it's so funny because, you know, everybody's got their opinions about everything, right? So like, I know that when I talk about my top 10, if somebody wants to listen to this podcast and they'll rip the heck out of me for it, then they can. <laughs> um, but like Wes Craven in, is is just one of those guys who I think they he got like it's always a good idea. I just don't know if it's executed to the fullest extent that it could have been. Um, Music of my heart. He did that one mm -hmm. while he was trying to get out of his horror phase because uh, he had been doing it for so long. And Music of my heart is a really good movie. I enjoy it. Uh, I, um, but I don't think anybody's like fantastic in that movie as far as acting goes, but you know, uh, so for him to be in a top 10 is a little bit of a stretch for me personally. So, but you know, you know what though, if you had to just pull one movie of his nightmare on Elm street was a sight to see in it's in 1984. I mean, that oh, was, absolutely. that, that was very creative and the idea of, you know, someone killing you in your dreams. It's kind of like, I mean, I just remember at that time when I was 11 and how creepy that was. And it had an effect on people. And now I look and just laugh at it. You know what I mean? But at well, the time it was a, it was a pretty big event. And you got to take this into consideration. I would probably say that Jason L. Miller is a very, uh, he's, he's into uh, the horror sci-fi thriller genre based on, Kubrick, Fincher, Hitchcock, and Wes yeah. Craven, and somebody somebody who's into that genre, like, I mean, it, that's one of my favorite genres, and Wes Craven's definitely on my top ten list, uh, because right. Last House on the Left, The Hills Have Eyes, Swamp Thing, but then you're right, like, he, he is a very, a very horror niche director for people that like that stuff. Shocker, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, A New Nightmare, Vampire in Brooklyn, the entire Scream franchise, Red Eye. Like, if you like horror, and it doesn't even have to be good horror. If you like crappy horror movies, like some of yeah. his horror movies are crap. Uh, but it, it goes along the lines with John Carpenter, who in the 70s was making, you know, The Fog and like all uh, Terror Train and like all kinds of like really bad horror films. But you kind of just lump them all together because you like that genre and you like some of the stuff that he's done. Um, yeah. So... I, I, I support Wes Craven being on there. Um, sure. We are going to go to Ryan Foster next. 
uh, Ryan Foster's list. Uh, first time we've seen Wes Anderson on here. Uh, unfortunately, that's a director that only did one movie that I ever liked, and that was Rushmore. Uh, I literally think every movie he's made since then has been garbage. But to each their own. I'm glad Ryan enjoys his movies. I know a lot of other people that do. Uh, Christopher Nolan is on another list. Steven Spielberg is on another list. Uh, the Wachowskis are on here. Um, I like the first Matrix movie. I, I was going to say, what did they make besides the first one that was... Didn't they do that Tom Hanks, good? Halle Berry movie? They, no, they that did. was any good. Like, like yeah, the first say, Matrix, yeah. Speed two, Racer. Second Matrix, third Matrix, yep. Cloud well, Atlas, Jupiter Ascending. Speed Racer. Like, Speed Racer. Good like, yeah, no, nothing else but the first Matrix is good. Again, in my it only takes the Matrix to put somebody... <laughs> you know to to make someone really like that director i mean again it goes back to what we were saying before we started filming it only takes one movie yeah uh maybe 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 the visual aspects that they brought to those other films are something that ryan enjoys like i I, i'll say speed racer looks good but i still thought it was a dumb movie Um, cloud atlas cloud atlas is uh uh yes but it's visually it's incredible to watch yes i'll agree with that the 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 makeup effects that they do on the same actors in different periods of that movie is is really cool to watch. Jupiter Ascending, I, I didn't I had I didn't even get that at the time of the day, but that's going to end up being Chris and Jenny's five dollar Walmart movie for the Christ, <laughs> Christmas one of these years when I find it in the bin. Yeah, that movie is really bad. There, there's you could probably find that bin in the bin now. Yeah. Uh, it's probably paired with two or three other really crappy sci-fi movies. Uh, George Miller, who, um, if I remember right, I, oh yeah, Mad no, Max. Yeah, Mad, I, I had to look it up. I didn't immediately recognize George Miller. So yeah, Mad Max, Twilight Zone, and Witches of Eastwick. Uh, Witches of Eastwick is good. Twilight Zone's fine. Uh, the Mad Max movies are fine. So George Miller's cool. The last uh, one blew me away. That was a really good one. Um, I was, I was just like enthralled and normally those type of theme movies out in the desert just kind of you don't know what year it is and i'm like bored with but for me charlize theron draws me in and any she can't go wrong anything she does practically and i just loved that movie uh i I didn't love the movie but i loved the fact that it literally took off and didn't stop. Like once, once the the action chase sequence begins, it's it's like 50, 60 straight minutes of like a nonstop action scene. Oh yeah! But the best part of that movie, I think, and it kind of goes along with I think the times today and whatnot, mm-hmm. what we're seeing in trends, is I almost didn't feel like it was a Mad Max movie. I felt like Mad yeah. Max passed the torch to Charlize Theron, and it was her movie is what I felt. I kind of felt like, oh, Mad Max just made an appearance, basically. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Anyways. Um, and they're making, they're making apparently making a sequel or another one, I think. Uh, it is a Formosa prequel. It is supposed to be when she was younger, Charlize Theron is not supposed to come back as of now. Um, they're casting somebody younger and basically doing a prequel of her character. Which, I mean, if you do it right, you can still have Charlize in there and bookend it somehow with making it a flashback or whatever um next up is Who's ron that? howard uh ron oh, howard is des- on his list deserving uh, francis ford coppola robert zemeckis who is on my list who i i really enjoy uh quentin tarantino and then th- this is one that when i saw harold ramus i couldn't believe i didn't think of it for my list like harold ramus uh did a lot of comedic gold this is exactly what I was telling Jason Mayer when I initially posted the the topic on uh-huh. Shane Talks. And Jason's like, pretty much, what's the point? Everyone's pretty much going to have the same directors. Who can come up with 10 directors? I'm like, are you kidding me? I can think of like several <laughs> directors and whatnot. And Jason's thinking like, everybody's going to have the same thing on the list. I'm like, no, there are going to be some surprises. You're and right. that was the first one where... Harold Ramis, and I'm like, Harold Ramis? I'm like, I never would have even, if I had to list 100 directors, I never even would have thought of Harold Ramis. Do I hate Harold Ramis? No. Is he a genius in, in, with comedy? 
yeah. Oh, yeah. But never would have thought about that. And so that was refreshing. And that was the whole point of people making out their list. Even though we'd have a lot of duplicates, sure. it's fun to see the surprise ones come, pop, pop up. Uh, any of those other names I was wrong. to you? Uh, he did Stripes, right? Uh, I believe so. Harold Ramis, yeah, Harold Ramis directed Stripes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're good. Uh, yeah, so his 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 directing list isn't super long, but it's Caddyshack, Vacation, Groundhog Day, Multiplicity, Analyze This, Analyze That. Unfortunately, he did Bedazzled, uh, and unfortunately, he did Year One. Not coming to our house this year. Okay, well, half the movies are good. So. <laughs> yeah, so the '70s, uh, '80s stuff. Uh, well, mostly '90s, mostly mid '90s, late '90s stuff. Uh, he no, wrote... the, the late '90s stuff is bad. Oh yeah, yeah, the late '90s stuff is bad. I got you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Jason, is there uh, either Francis Ford Coppola, Zemeckis, Ron Howard, any of those surprise you being on the list? Uh, they don't really yeah. surprise me. Zemeckis gets an automatic out of my top fifty directors because of the fact that he did what lies beneath which was a comedy for me that movie sucked beyond belief i remember no. jason richardson being really mad at me because i was laughing through so much of it because it was so bad uh when we were uh quality checking that movie he was like jason shut up and that like, movie oh, man, but this is the, this is what lies gold. beneath had some uh creepy moments in it and he sucks. didn't know what was coming and and it's 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 far-fetched it's a little over the top but I still enjoyed it. But the thing a that is, the, the thing that's amazing about it that movie is that is Robert Zemeckis, Zemeckis filmed Castaway. They stopped filming. He then went to go do What Lies Beneath, and then came back when Tom Hanks had to lose weight for the Castaway part. So they broke up the production in Castaway, and then he squeezes in What Lies Beneath right in the middle of that. It's just kind of like no, it doesn't matter. That's, that incredible. that's a wonderful feat for him to accomplish doesn't change the fact that that movie is horrible. Yeah, I so know. Literally takes, I'm just it, saying. It's, it's one I... of the very few times where a director gets to fall mightily from the from the tall mount, tallest mountains of good directing for you to go flying down. That crash. makes Jason, no sense. You like most like, Kevin Smith movies, okay? Well, stop, stop, I do, I, that makes no sense when we go back to our Wachowski conversation because literally you're telling me that one bad movie is is worse than Polar Express, Contact, uh, Forrest Gump, all three Back to the Future movies, uh, Death Becomes Her. Like, I feel like that's a great list of movies. And yeah, we just said every director's allowed a dud. Whoa, like, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that word didn't come out of my mouth. What you got, what we agreed on was one movie can make you a great director. Well, <laughs> one movie can make you a bad director, too. Because mm. man, that that that's one of my all-time most hated movies. And do you do like, you do you that, hate Robert oh. Zemeckis more than the Wachowskis, who have done one move one good movie compared to eight bad movies, and he's done eight good movies compared to one bad movie? Like you, do you hate him more than the Wachowskis? It doesn't make any sense when you say it out loud. It doesn't make logical sense whatsoever. But no, I don't like. I would never put the Wachowskis up near the top of a list of great directors either. Okay. So, like, I have no problem saying both and of that's them. that's why everyone has their own list. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say um, Ron Howard, I still think his best movie to date, well, Apollo 13 is great. I oh. still think A Beautiful Mind is is just an amazing story, and, and I thought it was a great film. Oh, come I on. agree. Ron you, Howard, Ron it, Howard is a good. I think it's because of Solo that we all can agree that he is the best director. Oh my god! Did you uh, not like Solo? No. It there's, was it was not that good. There is nothing redeeming in Solo for well, me. As I as, mean, didn't he have to come in and kind of pick up from there? Yes. Jaybird, I, I was making a joke. Sorry. Yeah. I, apparently, it did not land for you. So. I'm sorry. I didn't catch it. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good, man. <laughs> uh, real quick, let's talk about Jason Mayer's jokes real quick. I've Stella gotten was fun. I've gotten three texts in the last two weeks from people that said I didn't catch Jason's uh, Great Expectations joke either. So, number one, it makes me happy that people are listening so far into the podcast to hear his Great Expectations joke. 
but I'm glad I'm not the only one that didn't catch his great expectations joke. I'm just glad people got it. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody, no, nobody got it. Everybody's <laughs> texting me saying we didn't get the joke either, and that makes me they feel They should better. just rewind it, rewind it the 30 seconds and listen to it again. Hey it's Shane, okay. I'm coming. Yeah. I'm going back into the past here. Yeah, we just came up with another idea. We need to have eventually have a debate and an all discussion. Everybody needs to watch What Lies Beneath, and then we all need to come together and lay this out. All right, so uh, I'm getting hammered. I'm going to get hammered while I watch that movie. So and then on, I will do the podcast while I am drunk too. Hold on, here's the Let's fun thing. Here's the fun thing. One of the one of the things we've talked about doing with the podcast is uh, uh, we have a Twitch account where people could watch us live where we could watch what lies beneath drink while we watch it and we could interact with the people in the chat making comments about the movie i don't think i could be so annoyed by jason as much why, why <laughs> we uh that's that's something we can Ooh. definitely look into making happen. i've done that in the past before with that movie <laughs> uh let us move on to uh mr tim pendleton uh he also has steven spielberg on his list um Okay, before I before I read the rest of his directors, Tim's list was the first one where I was like, a lot of these are really out there. Not not out there for me. Like I understand why he picked them. I That's because Tim is like sixty. <laughs> I wouldn't have expected them from him, and and some of them some of them I have issues with, which we'll get to. Uh, his second one is Cecil B. DeMille, uh, Alfred Hitchcock, which I understand. Frank Oz, I understand, coming from Tim. Frank Capra did a lot of really good movies. I, I, I get that. Like what? Frank Capra? Uh, Wasn't Capra he did, a wonderful life? Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful life. The other thing the other thing that gets me with Frank Capra is because I did theater in high school, uh, I did a lot of plays that I was able to go watch Frank Capra movies. Uh, he apparently took a lot of stage productions and turned them into movies. Uh, you Can't Take It With You, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Arsenic and Old Lace, um, Lots of really good comedies. He 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 was a very good comedic director in my opinion, and I think he was very talented at taking the 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 three dimensional stage aspect of comedy and transferring it into a two dimensional medium of film. Because um, while I don't think those movies are amazing or fantastic, I I watched them uh, for because I did scenes from them in theater class and stuff like that. So. Um, I think Frank Capra is a good director at the time for what he was doing. Um, Billy Wilder uh, is somebody that I look up to as a director. I, I like his stuff. Uh, Julie Taymor is one that I don't agree with, should be on anybody's list. I don't agree with that one at all. What did she do? She did Titus in 1999, so that's the only thing that it had going for it. Uh, Frida, Across the Universe, and The Tempest. Those are her four movies that she's directed. I don't like she's any done, of them. She well, at least at least we've got a female on the, the list here. That's, a, that's true. See, uh, and I wanted to put Catherine Bigelow on mine. And that just didn't happen because she's only done one great movie and a few good ones. I'll agree with that. I noticed I noticed Tim's list when when they were posted through the thread and whatnot. And I find it interesting, while I respect the list. Mm-hmm. It definitely, you can see our demographic differences there. Gotcha. Our, uh, our, the, our, our ages and such. Because again, me, you know, people are going to look at Adrian Lyne and be like, who the hell's that? You know what I mean? And sure. Th he was big in the 80s. So yeah. I was around in the 80s, whereas a lot of people weren't, you know? So uh, Tim's last three are John Hughes, which I do agree with. Uh, Mel Brooks is an amazing, an amazing comedic director. Uh, and then Akira Kurosawa is another one that I appreciate the films that he did, but I don't love any of them except Seven Samurai. Well, Rashomon... Is that like a, go ahead. Is that like a Dave Lick... Did Dave Lick like him? Uh, I don't... I don't or so. did Castleton Arts do some festival? They did. Uh, for Kurosawa? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, like, I, I, I appreciate Kurosawa as a director because Seven Samurai is really good. I do really like Rashomon. Um, but, like, Yojimbo, Hidden Fortress, uh, Rayan, like his other ones are a lot lesser known as movies. Um, but as, as far as Asian martial arts cinema went, he was kind of ahead of his time. Um, uh, Did people come and see those movies during the festival, Jason? Oh, yeah. Like, I don't think it was, it wasn't like super successful. It wasn't like one of their best ones, 
but yeah, they definitely, he definitely has a following um, for people that want to, especially like the art house crowd is definitely in the Kurosawa. Okay. Uh, so Frank Oz, Mel Brooks, you guys have any thoughts on those two showing up on the list for the first time? I, it, I mean, Mel Brooks literally was one of the, I mean, he's definitely an honorable mention for me. To um, be or not to be is probably my favorite Mel Brooks movie. I've never seen that one. Um, but like, that dude, you can't you, deny Young Frankenstein is my all time favorite comedy movie. So like that movie is just, I can never get through that. End. What? But I know people love and respect that movie and think it's hilarious, but I can never get through Young Frankenstein. Really? But if you get a chance to watch To Be or To Not To Be or Not To Be. Oh, oh we lost Jason for a second. Uh, so I'll pick it up with Frank Oz. Um, Dark Crystal, Muppet Steak, Manhattan, Little Shop of Horrors, What About Bob? House Sitter was mentioned on somebody's like all-time favorite movies list. I think it's funny that he directed House Sitter, In and Out, Bowfinger, the Stepford Wives, the American remake of Death at a Funeral. Frank Oz has a decent resume, but he's not somebody I would ever think of when I'm like, this is a director I really like. Like, yeah. Well, Tim's going back to the Muppets. So. He's definitely going back to the Muppets. Okay. Uh, next up is Mark Stratton's list. Uh, he also has Christopher Nolan, who is an amazing director. Steven Spielberg is also on this list. Quentin Tarantino. Uh, Christopher Columbus, who I completely agree with. Um, I, I really enjoy a lot of Columbus movies. Uh, Richard Donner is awesome if you love action movies. His his action resume is fantastic. Uh, Sidney Pollock is somebody that I never would have thought of. Uh, this is a lot like Harold Ramis. I never would have thought, or Adrian Lynn, actually, more correctly, because when I went and looked at Sidney Pollock's uh, films, I was like, oh my god, I love all of these things that he, like a lot of these things he directed, and I never realized that they were all him. Tootsie, The Firm, Sabrina, Random Hearts, yeah. like, none of them are But like, see, again, that's amazing, the difference in our list. Again, it goes back to the demographics, because Mark is kind of in between Tim and me. Sure. And so we're, we lean older, so you're starting to get some obscure names that you're like, oh, I wouldn't have... Th you know, thought of that. Yeah. So. yeah his, his next two are definitely Penny and Gary Marshall, who have also done a lot of great stuff that, that when I think about directors, neither one of them pop into my head. But as soon as I look at their resumes, I'm like, wow, they, they have really directed a lot of movies that I like. Yeah. Um, League of their own big yep. jumping Jack flash. Yep. Uh, I mean, Gary, Pretty Gary, woman. Gary Marshall did overboard beaches, pretty woman, the other sister in 99. And he also directed Runaway Bride in 99. Um, like, that's a solid list right there, in my opinion. Um, then he has Dude, Tim he Bur was old at that point, too. Like, he was. He was like, it's kind of like Eastwood, what he's pulling off sometimes. Lately. <laughs> like, sometimes he can come out with two movies in a year, and you're like, Dude, you're like 94. Like, how are you still doing this? He just takes a Viagra and directs one quickly. <laughs> uh, he's got oh, Tim my Bur myths. He's got Tim Burton on his list. And then along the lines of Richard Donner, another really good action director is John McTiernan. Who... Yeah, but see, like, John McTiernan did two good movies, man. What, what did he, he do? He did two? Predator, okay. Predator, and Die Hard. He did both of those, and everything, like, those are my, like, I looked at his list because of the fact that I love those two movies. Yes. And and again, we again, if we can make one if one movie can make you as a director, then, you know, two movies should be able to make you as a director as well. I disagree with you on his list because other than those two, he does have Hunt for Red October, which I love, Last Action Hero that I love, uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance, which I think is a great movie. Uh, the Thomas Crown Affair came out in 1999. Oh, and then we hit The 13th Warrior was 1999 and Roller Ball. Games. And oh, this must be John McTiernan. Yeah, we're we're still talking about John McTiernan. So yeah, um, I I still I still feel like he has more that I like and really enjoy than ones that I hate. You're right. You're right. And John McTiernan definitely. I mean, I I guess when I looked it up, I was, um, the Hunt for Red October being on that list as well as say I um while I enjoy the Last Action Hero and I like watching it, I don't think it's a great movie by any stretch. It's so um, fun. Last it, it, Action it, Hero is so much better today than it was when it 
debuted. When it debuted, I was so disappointed. But then really? it just became this bad cult movie over the years. Which, which is really strange to me because, like, a whole lot of people hated that movie, like, the moment it came out, which didn't was it done? feel... Well, I know it was a dud, but I didn't feel like it was deserving of the negative that it was receiving. Well, so, because like, it wasn't that great of a story or... A kid gets a magic ticket and gets sucked into epic, an action movie. Best like, thing ever. I love I, I enjoy it a lot. I think it's fun. But it just didn't... It was... At the time, it just didn't connect. And it now gave I can Schwarzenegger watch it a chance a, to make know, fun of other movie. action movies. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will say uh, his his last directorial thing he's credited with is a movie called Basic in 2003, and I really enjoy that one. Great uh, movie. I it was one of the, it, it's it going back to Akira Kurosawa. Um, it's it has a storytelling narrative, uh, like a Kurosawa film where it leads you to believe one thing and then shows you the truth like in the in the last five to ten minutes. Um, oh, so the I, twist uh, on that! The twist on that was like, what? Yeah, that was that was really good storytelling, and I really enjoy I really enjoy Basic as a film. Which makes you wonder why he and, and is he dead? Uh, let me check. No, nope. I don't think, I don't think he yeah. is. Like, it just makes me wonder. It just makes me wonder how that's his last movie. Uh, when he, the moment you say Basic, like all three of us are like, that was awesome. Like yeah. I really enjoyed that movie. He has um, a movie in pre-production right now called Tau CD4. Um, I have never heard of it. I have no idea what this is even about. And the Wikipedia page listed as a group of rebels set out to kill the oligarchs and military thugs who terrorize a war-torn planet in the remote Tau CD solar system. And that will be straight to voodoo. Apparently Uma, <laughs> apparently Uma Thurman is attached to this film. And that'll be straight to voodoo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I have not heard of that. Jumping on to Pat Dyer's list, he also has Christopher Nolan and Steven Spielberg. Um, this is the, even though Jason has mentioned it previously, this is the first list where somebody actually wrote Kevin Smith's name. Um, we don't need to touch on Kevin Smith right now because we'll get to that when we get to Jason and I's lists. Um, another list with Wes Anderson, who I don't care for. Um this is also the first list that mentions Taika Waititi, um, which I like him as a person. I don't necessarily know that I like him as a director because I just feel, I, I feel like he's like hot right now. Like obviously he did a Mandalorian episode and that makes him really cool. And uh, I don't care for Thor Ragnarok as far as the Marvel cinematic universe goes. Um, what we do in the shadows was okay and fun, um, but I didn't think it was amazing in any way. So, I didn't uh, see Jojo Rabbit yet. Yeah, and I haven't seen haven't Jojo seen Rabbit it. either. Can we talk about Wes Anderson for a second? If you want to, let's talk about him. He did one good movie. I, I, called I, I, I am by not, I am by far not a huge fan of his movies, but he does have a creative vision that I respect. And like, uh, what is it? The one about the hotel or something? Uh, Green, Hotel Budapest. Grand, Hotel, Budapest, Grand Hotel, Budapest Hotel. Like Hotel. Yep. Yeah, and I know he, he does this with other movies, but there are moments where it's like in between scenes, and he's got like these uh, kind of fake backgrounds. Yeah. That, that are I love that when when that you see that in 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 films and such, like the the Mister uh, Rogers movie that was just out. Mm -hmm. Like they did that with transitioning from place to place oh nice every once in a while i just kind of like that because it's such a throwback to you know the 70s and 80s and such so but i like him from that at that aspect and that just that's his stamp on on his movies i i don't think i've watched an entire movie of his looking at his list of things uh -huh. i know i've started i know i've started rushmore i know i started um life aquatic i know i started fantastic mr fox moonrise kingdom uh but i i think it was one of those things for me that every time i tried i couldn't get into it so now i've stopped I've well stopped you know trying. all the characters in those movies are people who i just would not want to fucking know 
Yep. I like, I would like, I would not be friends with any of these people. I would be bored to death. I mean, yep. Well, they, they could be slightly entertaining in a sense, but it's just kind of like you want, it's that, that dry humor. I don't know if I could sit around for hours and talk to someone like that. Yeah. I agree. And so it turns me off. It's like, uh, but it, it's, it's into, it's smart intellectual writing, but it's, it's dry and boring. I a hundred percent agree. Uh, and I will say uh, he has made two movies that I've enjoyed. Uh, I do think Rushmore is a very good movie. Uh, because of Rushmore, I got into his first film, which was called Bottle Rocket, which was him and Luke Wilson and Owen Wilson, like making a super low budget movie. Uh, so I did like I did like Bottle Rocket, but I mean I hated Royal Tenenbaums. I absolutely hated Life Aquatic. Um, I didn't like anything in Darjeeling Limited, and I'm pretty sure I haven't watched. I don't think I've watched any of his movies since then because I just. I, I just hated too many of his things in a row. Uh, my brother loved Moonrise Kingdom, my brother Michael. And he was like, you should watch it. It's fantastic. And I I think I made it about 40 minutes. And I was just like, I can't do this. Like, I really just don't care for his his style at yeah. all. Is so, that where they're at the camp or something? Yeah, that's the camp one with the, with the boy and the girl who were writing letters to each other. I feel like all of those movies are the same. <laughs> oh, they that they feel that way. Like there, it doesn't feel like there's much of a um, a disconnect between his films. It's um, yeah, it, it feels like all of them are made the exact same way. Uh, other other names that have been on other lists are uh, John Hughes, Quentin Tarantino, um, Martin Scorsese. Uh, it's the first time we've seen the Coen Brothers on here, which. I'm fine with the Coen brothers. Overall, I like their body of work. They've, I, I'm one of the few people that does not like Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, but I, I like Blood Simple and some of their other stuff. Um, and then David O. Russell was the one on this list where, like Adrian Lynn, I had to look him up. And David what? O. Russell, yeah, I, Three Kings, I should have known. 1999, Three Kings, should have known that. But Fighters, Silver Linings Playbook, yeah. Very, very good body work. Ah, he also had a, a movie in the 90s called Flirting with Disaster with um, um, Taylor Alan Alda, Alda, Lily yes. Tomlin. Yep, which was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, which was so, – and so for me, David O. Russell is one of those guys where, like, it's hit or miss. And, like, you look at, like, that movie versus, um, you know, like, The fight, the Fighter, The Silver Linings Playbook. Um, and Both I think fantastic three films. Three Kings are great movies, but like the what, what's it called? What's the, what's the movie called that I hate that you just said from the nineties? Oh, uh, flirting with disaster. Flirting with disaster. Yeah, flirting with disaster. That almost could have been like in that uh, Wes Anderson, just a weird offbeat humor that's just like, oh. And I'm glad that O. Russell kind of got on a different track and and started doing a different movies i because i couldn't have dealt with that shit interesting because the comedy in, in flirting with disaster doesn't bother me it's it, i enjoy that movie oh no it just oh god it's just, which oh. is for me um uh three kings i always enjoyed mm -hmm. i never knew who really directed it because that wasn't something i like really was into at that point in time um really like that movie uh, Spike Jones is hilarious in that film. Yep. Um, but then, like, when I saw George Fighter, Clooney's first uh, fuck scene too. Oh. Um, didn't know at the that. beginning. Um, uh, doesn't he? In in 1996, he has sex with J Lo in Out of Sight. No, like fuck, fuck. Oh, okay. Okay. Like ah 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 ah, you know. <laughs> not making not making love. Oh, like, okay. Fuck. Okay. I see. <laughs> so the fighter, yep, the fighter. Um, takes place in Boston or yep. Massachusetts. So no big surprise that I really wanted to see it. Also was shot at a movie theater that my brother David worked at at the time. Oh, um, they had a they had a scene or they had a scene inside and outside of the uh, the building, and um, and it's one of those things where like I really enjoy that in Silver Linings Playbook, but then man like. American Hustle, I really wanted to like it and just didn't dig it. Yeah, and then, I agree. And then Joy came out, and I was like, oh, well, maybe he just hit a dud with that one, and I'll enjoy this. So then I started watching Joy, and I was like, yeah, no, I'm done with this one, too. Like, it, I never like, watched that one. 
I liked American Hustle. I thought American Hustle was good. It's it's not one I could throw in and watch every day, but every once in a while I'll put it in and it's just I respect that film a lot. Oh, and wait, I and I never thought that like I always thought Amy Adams was kind of homely cute, but in American Hustle she was like actually freaking hot. Like well, and what I do like about American Hustle is like in like the the time period, like they the costumes look wonderful, the scenery looks like like them using you know retro seventies uh, cars while they're doing the movie. I thought it, it like it just it it looks fantastic. I just didn't care for the story a whole lot. So. And 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 I think we should mention Silver Linings Playbook. Um, that is one of those movies that I think it's a rarity that just come kind of comes along. And I just think it's got a lot of heart and it was just the right time, the right place um, for the release of that movie. And it kind of grew into something big and respectful and did a lot of money and, and such, but you just, it, it's just one of those movies, few movies that comes along that you just, you, you fall in love with the characters and it just showed a lot of the flaws that, the characters had that I think a lot of people can identify with or they know someone who's kind of offbeat like those characters Absolutely. and that's one of the few movies where the characters are a little offbeat but you know what you you, you still like them though um so with the Cullen brothers we got blood symbol raising arizona uh fargo uh hudsucker proxy big lebowski um no country for old men I, I like a lot of their early work compared to their stuff they did after like '96. But how do you guys feel overrated? About I I will I will agree with overrated. Um, again, they're they're that they're that niche film directors that they have their their small audience that just loves them like Trump has his base. <laughs> the Cohen brothers have have this niche base that just love everything that they do. And it's kind of a hit or miss with me on a Coen Brothers movie. Um, Fargo is so out there, but for some reason I can, I'm just drawn into it and it's so offbeat, but I like it. Um, and I just thought No Comfort, Country for Old Men was just as, as, as quiet and dry as that movie was, it was effective. And what's his name? Uh, with the guy who won the Oscar in it, Javier Bardem. Javier yes. Bardem scared the shit out of me in that movie, and him walking down that hallway when the dude was in the hotel room yep. and he hears them walking down. I mean, that was a very good movie. I didn't think it went Best Picture, but I was like, okay. I um my my Coen Brothers for the most part are misses. Okay. Uh, for me personally, No Country for Old Men. It's a lot like a Spike Lee movie for me. Like, I liked ninety percent of that movie, and then the end, I just felt like if they would have been a little bit more creative, I I almost felt like because it. How does it end? It ends with the Tommy Lee uh, monologue, I think. Sounds. I think right. it I ends with the monologue. Was... Anyways, I, I felt like that. if. If they would have swapped the last two scenes, I felt like it would have felt better for me personally. But um, it, it's the, we are um, like everybody told me that I would love Oh Brother Where Art Thou, and like that was one of those movies where like I heard the soundtrack for months before I ever saw the movie, uh, if not years, and I finally was like, you know what, I'll give this movie a chance. This and, and I do enjoy the music because every time I tell somebody I didn't like the movie, they're like, but the music's awesome, and I'm like, yes, but a music, <laughs> but music does not make a movie. So yeah, I like the music a lot. It's it's a cool sound. Um, and then I watch the movie and I'm just like, I'm bored. I really don't enjoy this film at all. So yeah. Never seen Blood Simple, although I hear good things. Blood Simple is really good. I highly recommend that. But not surprised that they popped up on someone's list. Oh, no. No. All right. So uh, we are on to my list now. Uh, It is my turn to go through uh, these amazing directors that nobody can say anything bad about. Uh, Kevin Smith is my number one. He is age appropriate for me. He writes dialogue that I relate to. He writes characters that I relate to. Even his ridiculous scenes that he writes i find ways to relate to them um huge kevin smith fan 
Uh, Cameron Crowe, uh, I've loved for a long time. I'm pretty sure I'm the only person that has him on his top 10 list. Uh, but oh, did two people? Uh, no, no, no. I was gonna say that for me, it's only two movies he's ever done that I really love. Oh man, I really, I, I agree that some There's of his more than that later, like Aloha wasn't that great. Um, but I mean, like, uh, um, say anything was great, uh, but uh, almost famous, Jesus, sorry, I was losing the word almost famous. Um, Almost Famous was amazing. Like you said, Say Anything was great. Um, Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire. Like, he just, he, he I, I love Cameron Crowe, and I get made a, fun of it a lot. And also, uh, we'll address this, that Abre Las Ojos uh, is one of my all-time favorite films. It's a Spanish film from 1997. Uh, in order to make, um, in order to remake the movie, him and Tom Cruise had to, uh, give Alejandro Amenabar the rights to make the movie The Others with Nicole Kidman so that they could get the rights to make the remake uh, of Abre Las Ojos, which became Vanilla Sky, which is an absolute piece of garbage. Um, my all-time favorite director remade my all-time favorite film and turned it into the, one of the worst things I've ever seen, but it's only because I was so emotionally attached to Abre Las Ojos that I expected more from Vanilla Sky. Um, but like, I mean, I love We Bought a Zoo. Like, We Bought a Zoo is just such a fun, like, he made up for it with We Bought a Zoo. Like, it's a good family movie of just like a no, guy. No, Shane, it's, it's We Bought a Zoo. <laughs> um, uh, so after, after Cameron Crow, I've got two horror directors that we've talked about, uh, with John Carpenter and Wes Craven, because they, <laughs> they are very influential, like, in, in my love of horror. Um, John Hughes falls into the same category with Cameron Crow and Kevin Smith. Uh, he did a lot of movies when I was growing up that I really enjoyed and related to and had a lot of fun watching. Um, like the fact that he, the fact that he wrote Home Alone and I know Christopher Columbus was on somebody else's list, but like Home Alone and Uncle Buck and all of those like family comedies in the, in the mid to late nineties, like I really enjoy the stories of those. Um, Christopher Nolan has been on a lot of people's lists. Uh, I, I saw Memento in 2001, fell in love with it, went back and watched Following, became obsessed with Following, um, and I, I don't... The only Nolan film that's not a masterpiece for me is Insomnia, and it's, it, it's because, like, literally the day before I watched Insomnia, I watched the Swedish version of it, and I was like, wow, this movie's really intense. It's really, uh, it was a Criterion DVD of it, like, really really got me into into the movie the the swedish one and then unfortunately went the next day watched watched his version of insomnia um and it just it didn't it didn't hit me the same way so i regret ever watching the first version uh, i wish i would have just watched christopher nolan's version um robert zemeckis is on my list for the stuff that i listed off earlier the back to the futures and and all of those movies uh, Joe Johnston is on my list because he did a lot of movies growing up that I absolutely love and hold like as, as a very special place in my heart. Um, Could easily is easily an honorable mention. What? Okay, let, let's 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 talk. Let's let's center on that because yeah. I don't think anyone else picked Joe Johnston. And let's just take a, a minute to let's, talk got, about this. Was that, was that I Honey, it. I Shrunk the Kids? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, The Rocketeer, The Page Master, Jumanji. In 1999, he directed October Sky. Then right. he did Jurassic Park 3, which I enjoy. Um, I did too. And then he did some crap with Hidalgo and Wolfman. But then he made up for that with Captain America, the first Avenger, uh, which is personally my favorite of the three Captain America movies. And what was the next one that he did? Uh, after that was a movie called Not Safe for Work. No, that's not the one I was thinking. Oh, of. I was thinking I was thinking he did Gremlins, but that was Joe Dante. Yeah, that was Joe Dante. Yeah, which did okay. not show up on anybody's lists. And he's another one that I bet he has got a good little, handful he has of a movies. Good handful of movies, yeah. Uh after after Not Safe for Work, he did a movie called The Nutcracker in the Four Realms. It must have been something else I was thinking of. Gotcha. Um so I I'm really big fan of joe johnston he, he did a lot of stuff when i was younger that still resonates with me and that i find really good uh ben affleck is the next one on my list 
uh, because I think Gone Baby Gone in the town, uh, Argo is okay, but Gone Baby Gone in the town are literally two of the best films I've seen in the last 10 years. Um, from writing, directing, action, uh, storylines, plot, everything I think in those two movies is fantastic. Um, then my last pick, before I knew this was going to be a podcast, my last pick was actually a joke, uh, but I'm going to make myself stand by it. But I said Michael Bay, but I put the I put the caveat on only from 94 to 98. Because, because I love the music video that he did for Meatloaf. I love the, the Rock. I love Armageddon. And I love um, Bad, Bad Boys. So... Those those four things during that four year time period are 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 four things that I think were very well directed and I really enjoy. Unfortunately, after that, Michael Bay decided that he really didn't give a shit about making real movies anymore. Uh, and you didn't like the the first Transformers. I liked. It. I was about to say I did like the very first Transformers, but it really had nothing to do with him. Like anybody could have directed that. Um, but uh, two thousand eight, I think that was like. I, I, I went back to being a 12-year-old kid in that opening scene. Like, when when the helicopter lands and then starts transforming at that military base, like, I remember where I was and how giddy I got watching that. Because, I mean, that was something I've seen only ever in cartoon form. And then it was happening in live action. The, the movie, the first Transformers, I think is a fine movie. I enjoy it. I, I watch it. Uh, none of the four sequels are, are worth anything, and those were all Michael Bay pissing me off even more. Um, but I, I feel like almost anybody could have directed that first movie, and I'd still I'd still like it a lot. Why do you think, to this day, Armageddon, Armageddon gets so much shit? It gets so panned. It shouldn't. It's an amazing film. Dude, Bruce, that movie, when I Willis saw it for the first the time... Day. When I, when I saw that for the first time, I remember being in the theater, and I can't remember if I was a... I, I want to say it was a, a promotional screening that I got tickets into. And, like, dude, I laughed. I was I cried at the end of the movie. Like, uh, it had an emotional impact on me in so many different spots in that film. Um, Do you think if Ben Affleck were not in that movie, you would like it still? Oh, dude, I still love that it's movie. Bruce Willis. It's it's Steve Buscemi, it's Owen Wilson, uh, William Fichtner is in it. Uh, uh, Billy Bob Thornton is amazing. Like Billy Bob Thornton walking up to shake Liv Tyler's hand at the end, like that's absolutely amazing. Freaking um, uh, John Coffey, what? The, uh, oh, Michael Clark Duncan. Michael Clark Duncan when he's like, "You the man, Harry." Hey, yep. Or Harry, you the man, and it's just Aerosmith, like it's just like guys, Aerosmith. <laughs> Um, well, that was, was 98, Samari. right? And it was 98. That was 98. Peter that was Samari a big is the song. Like, that was like the summer of 98. Like, I can't believe it's been 22 years. Like, yep. holy jeez. Give me my cane now. I mean, man, when that when that song kicks in, like, obviously, everybody had heard that song a hundred times on the radio before the movie came out. But when that movie come, when that movie came out, and it's it's the video sequence between between um. Uh, Liv Tyler. Harry, between Liv Tyler and Harry, like, and that song starts kicking in, like that. That still got me emotionally, like that. That was a great, great song. For, that whole soundtrack is pretty decent. I remember there's like some Bon Jovi on there. Um, I remember it being Bob really Seger. enjoyable. Bob Seger. Uh, lots of that really good, like, uh, poppy rock music. Um, is there anybody else on my list that we need to discuss? Well, you mentioned John Hughes. We've talked about him. Yeah, we've talked um, about him. Zemeckis, we talked I, about. I was really, I was uh, going back to Cameron Crow. Yep. Um, I'm surprised you didn't mention um, singles. That's the, oh, that was for a sure. really yes. yes kind of big back in its day when I was in college. Uh, yeah, singles, singles was phenomenal. Um, uh, I, I, obviously, as a Pearl Jam fan, I enjoyed seeing Pearl Jam in there and, and their music being used in it. Um, being a music fan, I enjoyed having like the the back the backstory being about, you know, a guy in a band and stuff like that. Um, Kira Sedgwick is really the, the one part of that movie that I wish would have been cast differently. Like I just maybe, maybe I, so my comment is I find her to be too plain of a person, 
but that potentially could be what he was going for. Like, that's that's probably a directorial choice that he wanted somebody that's just very simple and plain. But watching the movie, I I just was I wasn't attracted to the main character, so it it, it didn't play with me perfectly. The story was still really good. I just I didn't find myself being attracted to the main female character in a in a love story. I like um, Cameron Crowe's interviews about how he goes about picking his music for this movies. I think there's a nice backstory to all of that. And his sure. wife, who is, uh, what was it, Annie Wilson of, or what's her name, Nancy Wilson of Nancy Heart? Wilson. Heart. Yep. It would help him with the soundtrack choices and such. And I thought that was pretty cool. I, I, I love the fact that she has a cameo in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which uh, he wrote when he was uh, a lot younger and she just has a, a quick cameo in the movie. I think that's really hilarious. Um, and then I just this week watched the 20th anniversary reunion of Almost Famous, uh, where they had Cameron Crowe, Kate Hudson, um, uh, Billy Crudup, Patrick. and Patrick Fugit all got together and were talking about it. it's an hour long and they talk about the production process of making it and everything. Um, and Cameron Crowe tells a really good story about how a lot of times on set he would start playing music for people to try to get them in their mindset of like, this is, this is what your character should be thinking, you know, around this time. Well, he tells a really good story about Philip Seymour Hoffman. And the very first day of filming was the day that they shot uh, him at the record, uh, at the record studio. Uh, and he's like walking around, picking out records and like dancing around and doing stuff. Apparently, like halfway through the scene, Cameron Crowe decided to crank on some music. I can't remember what song he said it was. But Philip Seymour Hoffman literally just stopped and looked at him and he was like, cut, like stop, cut. And Cameron Crowe was like, uh-oh, like I like I'm supposed to I'm supposed to say cut. Why why is he making me stop like what I'm doing? So they go over and they have a conversation, and Philip Seymour Hoffman looked at him and said, Hey, what makes you think that whatever song you just started playing is better than the song that I already had in my head while I was doing this scene? And Cameron Crowe said, you know what? You're right. No more music. I, I will let you do the scene with whatever you have in your head. Um, and I just thought that was a really cool story about Philip Seymour Hoffman because I have heard a lot of times that Cameron Crowe plays music on sets for his actors. Uh, and I just thought it was really cool that Philip Seymour Hoffman stood up to him. Who would have ever thought the guy from Twister <laughs> would become this respectful actor and then pass away? Yeah, very sad. All right, let us jump to Jason's list next. All right, so uh, the ones that we've already mentioned are Spielberg. Um, uh, I mean, his body of work just kind of talks for itself and the way he can create worlds. Um, while I don't think, like, Ready Player One by any means is anywhere close to his best movie, uh, just like... Uh, but according to Shane, he had great source material on that to help him plant those seeds. Oh, yeah. I love the race sequence, uh, which I hear is not in the book, correct? No. Um, absolutely love the shining moment. Not in the book. Uh, yeah, so like it, like at least some of that's got to do with him. Um, but yeah, I just think he's a great visionary, and I think he pushes the envelope a lot with what he does. And, you know, he is who he is, right? So um, The shining moments, what? Uh, the shining moment in um in Ready Player in One. Ready Player One. When they have to when go to the have Overlook to go Hotel. Into the room with the lady. Have you not oh, seen? Oh, I see. I've not seen Ready Player One yet. I've got oh. it. I just haven't watched it. Yeah, you should. You time. should watch it. Yeah. Um. Next up is James Cameron. Uh, I can't Which, think of a single movie that I've watched of his that I don't fully enjoy. Uh, the only one that I, I'd say. Lois, I've never seen Piranha 2 when he did that one, which was for, um, for uh, oh God, who is that? Corbin uh, Studios? Uh, uh, Roger Corman. Oh, uh, Roger Corman. Um, so I've never seen that, but looking at the rest of his body of work is just awesome. Uh, my only, the low point for me, uh, while Avatar is a wonderful visual film and I love the 3D in it, it's not a good movie overall. Uh, it's just very plain and repetitive of the same kind of narrative that we've seen played out with Dances with Wolves and Fern Goldie and all sorts of other films. Yep. Um, but Wait, you I, take the time I'm, to watch Fern Goldie? 
Oh, Hello, dude, when that Fern came Gully. out, I was the, I was the age appropriate when it came out. So. I own I own Fern Gully, both DVD and digitally. Um. So next up on my list is Mel Gibson. Well, uh, real quick, I want to address James Cameron for a quick second because sure. I just watched The Abyss this week, and it's really awkward because I The Abyss is a phenomenal movie. Um, the digital version I had available to me was the the theatrical cut, and I didn't realize how ingrained in my brain the director's cut is um Mm -hmm. because i'm watching the movie and i'm like wait a minute i'm pretty sure that there is like i'm pretty sure this scene has this other stuff in it and i'm pretty sure this and most most notable is is the ed harris sequence at the very end uh with the aliens like it was over at a finger snap like he takes his helmet off he looks at the aliens and all of a sudden shit's rising up to the top of the ocean i'm like it was like a 10 minute conversation that they have back and forth. Like yep. I didn't, I didn't realize that like I've watched the director's cut so many times that that's like the version I remember. Um, well, and that's the weird thing for me with aliens. Okay. It's the same thing. It's like, there's so much in the director's cut. That's not in the regular theatrical cut that when I watch the theatrical cut, I'm, I do the same thing. It's kind of like watching a friend's episode and knowing that the jokes aren't there that yep. should be there. Yep. Um, I think the uh, I think the abyss was way ahead of its time. Oh, Absolutely. for sure, for sure. It, it was so... way ahead of its time. It should have done much better than what it did. It was, but it was too intelligent for its time. It it's so weird being an alien movie that has literally only like three real alien sequences in it. The opening with the submarine when the alien comes into their vessel and does the does the whole water face thing. Face. Yep. And then the very, very end with Ed Harris and the aliens and the ship coming up. Like, the rest of it, you've got Michael Bean being a douchebag and, like, trying to turn this into, like, a military thing. And you've just got, like, m- much like uh, much like Aliens, very very claustrophobic, dialogue-centric scenes that, that, are, that are tense and just play out well. Like, even the non-director's cut was like two hours and ten minutes, I think it was. Like it yep. felt kind of slow, um, but it's still really good. Um, but like, but thinking about like the rest of his bodies of work is and what he's been able to do for cinema since he got on board. Um, I think True Lies is probably maybe the best spy movie for me personally. That's just um, a lot of fun. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. It's and entertaining. Um, next up, I had Mel Gibson. I, I don't think that there is a movie... I don't think there's a director who has taken nearly the crazy steps. Not from a, not from a mental standpoint, but from like literally like Apocalypto and Passion of the Christ are two of the craziest ideas, in, in my mind, of something that a well-known mainstream movie director would do like apocalypto is like that's nuts man like the fact like in that movie that movie hits you hard it like it like from the beginning to the end i felt like i was on that journey with them and then passion of the christ if you can watch that without crying and not feeling absolutely like devastated and destroyed emotionally from that movie i don't i, I don't know so, I uh, couldn't do it. I, I could not do it to this day. Still, I have never seen that movie, and I just, I just can't do Dude, it. it. It, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's a hard watch. But yeah, I will, I will give you the fact that Apocalypto, Passion of the Christ, and Braveheart are all good projects. Uh, but of his directorial things, I think The Man Without a Face is probably my favorite film he's ever done. Ooh, like, I mean, that's a that's a really good movie. That is a like really that good movie. It, it's one of those ones where I enjoy characters uh, trying to escape their past, like characters who who made mistakes. And like, I mean, they leave it kind of ambiguous. You don't really know it. Like, they never really tell if you if he, he did, did the stuff not. that he's accused of. It, it, I mean, in in modern cancel culture, he was literally being canceled without any proof. A, like there, there was no proof that he did the things that he was accused of. So like, yeah. I I enjoy he he is a he is a scarred and damaged individual who finds happiness in helping out this little boy, and then has to deal with the repercussions when his past comes to light. Um, um and Hacksaw Ridge, like I haven't seen that one. It's uh, good. Uh, really uh really good movie it's one of those things where 
you just don't under like stand why people had to be like you understand it's just amazing to watch somebody's journey and somebody being so um devoted that they they were like no this is how i have to do it this is how i'm going to do this no matter what you want me to do um it, oh, it's okay. just a it's really a effective film. film yeah okay um Kevin Smith is, uh, I'm sorry, Kevin Smith on my list. Uh, I, I resonate with him because, like Shane said, time period was right when Clerks first came out and was right when I was starting to, uh, it was like the year before I worked at a movie theater or like six months by the time I watched that movie. Um, so like, I totally understood, like I, I was like, I already knew some of the stories from other people working there and stuff. Um, but yeah, just, um, Chasing Amy is by far his film, best film for me. For sure. Uh, but I also like what he has done lately in taking chances and just being like, screw the studio system. I want to make my movies the way I want to make them. I'm, I don't need them since he's got such a cult following. He can do what he wants to do. Yep. And I haven't What's seen. What's he done recently? Um, the one that I really enjoyed and thought was really cool was Red State. Um, it's, it's not conventional by any stretch of the mean, by no means is it conventional. Um, but it's, it, it it's constantly, guns? huh? Is it about guns? No. Uh, it's, it's a, it's about a religious cult. Yeah. Essentially that, and that ends up taking three boys by like, cause they don't approve of what they're going to, what they're trying to do with their lives and like trying to deliver them from evil essentially and and like all sorts of weird stuff happens and all these curveballs get thrown your way and oh kind of like shit really... going on today in 2020 yes. <laughs> so um so it, it it doesn't feel cohesive while you're watching it but when you're done and you think about it it's almost like a spike lee movie like we were talking about because yep. like at the end you're like damn i'm gonna think about this movie for a while like <laughs> And not everybody likes likes to make those kind of films. Um, Joss Whedon, he's on my list. Uh, Shane, to answer your questions from earlier, you were talking about it and we were debating it. Um, while he did do both Avengers movies, and I'm very much in favor of one, and the other one's fine. I don't hate it as much as you do. No, um, I hate but it's, um, I thought James uh, Spader was awesome in that role. I just don't think the movie is really works. Yeah, he's the highlight um, of the movie, but there's so much stupidity in that movie that it doesn't work for me. I, and, and I will agree, it's definitely near the bottom of the list for the MCU for me. Yep. Um, but he did do Serenity as well, which is easily in my top 10 movies as well as The Avengers. And if you're in my top 10, twice in my top 10 movies, there's no way I can't put you in my top 10. And then on top of that, all the Buffy, all the Angel, all the Firefly, all the Dollhouse, like all of those shows that I really enjoyed, most of those episodes are are directed by him. Okay. So um, so it's hard for me to not have him in my top 10. Uh, next one up I have is James Mangold, um, which is, I know I'm, I think I might be the only one that answered with him. And um, that is another one that when I looked him up, I was like, no shit, he has a great list of movies. Dude, from, he had a little softer side. From 1999, he did Girl Interrupted. Um, before that, he did Copland, which is one of those weird, weird Sylvester Stallone movies that I really like. Like, I, I feel like Stallone did a great job being like that cop. Um, I like Identity a lot. Uh, obviously, he did the, the Wolverine and Logan. Um, Jason, is it because of Kate and Leopold and Walk the Line that you like him? <laughs> And, and I won't lie; those the, those definitely help uh, my swaying of that. Okay. Um, I think Joaquin Phoenix and, and Walk the Line, along with Reese Witherspoon, like I never, uh, I never like, never got into um, Johnny Cash before that. Okay. But like, f like I felt those performances. I thought they were awesome. I think Reese very much to, uh, delivered oscar-winning gold with that performance i thought she was amazing in that role um but then you got like ford versus ferrari which was one of the best movies of the that year uh last year right like, yep last that year that was last year i um, still need to watch so, that like it's, it's dude, amazing. so effective so good i, I hate i 90 percent of the time i hate biopics there's not very many biopics i like 
Um, but Ford versus Ferrari was one that I knew the story going in, so I really thought I was going to hate it, and I really enjoyed the performance. Like, Matt Damon is really good in it, and Christian Bale is just phenomenal. Like, I, I, I expected to hate the movie, and I found nothing in the movie to hate. Um, Christian Bale could play a black dude, and he'd be awesome. <laughs> He's like the, he's like the male, he's like the male Meryl Streep on us. He's not allowed to do that nowadays. So, um, but um, yeah, like, and besides that, he also was a huge driving force in um, the Greatest Showman. To know oh, all sure. the behind the scenes stuff they did with that, um, and I, from what they say, he he did have some directing that he did in that movie. He didn't do the whole thing, but um, but yeah, like he's. I, I I never would have thought about it, but when I was trying to put this list together, I was like, what movies do I really enjoy? And what and so and then I started thinking of like all the stuff that he's directed and really enjoyed that. Clint Eastwood up next. So like um Ooh. growing up, my dad, I'm an army brat. My dad was in the army. My um Heartbreak Ridge was literally one of those movies that was on repeat in my house all the time. And and, and I don't know if anybody 1986. else. 1986. I was going to say, Jaybird's shaking his head. I don't know, Shane, if that played in your house a lot or it not. It did not. I actually haven't seen that movie. Uh, so it's a rated R movie. It's it, it, it's it, it was it looks like it was all shot in California, even movie. though there's love, like an invasion into a different like country. Um, but um, I love that movie, um, and that was really the reason why I started liking Clint Eastwood. It was way back in the day. Um, because I, I was a little bit too young for me to get into him for Dirty Harry and all the other and the, sure. the outlaw Josie Wells and all the uh, um, westerns that he was doing. But like, Clint you look at his body of work and you can't. You, there's nothing you can tell me that is bad in that in that body. Clint Eastwood so. is one of those weird ones where because he directs so many things that he acts in, I don't. I don't really think about him as a director all the time. Like when I went to like look at his list of what he actually directed, I couldn't believe some of the stuff that was on there. They're like, I mean, I, I think I knew that he directed the rookie, but I really, I really enjoy the movie, the rookie, uh, yeah. a, a perfect world is an amazing film with him and Kevin Costner. Um, Midnight in the garden of good and evil was one that I really enjoyed at that time when it came out. I thought it was a really good, like mystery thriller movie. Um, and then mystic river was, was one that I thought was phenomenal. Um, I, and it's just million like million dollar baby. Yeah. And million dollar baby is fine. That was one that I, I waited a long time to watch because of the hype on it. Um, and, and I think it's just okay. It, it was, it was, the, the movie was spoiled for me before I watched it. I don't Fucking know how much, sad. yeah, I don't know how much that affected my viewing of it, but like, I thought I'm Grand Torino. Like I really enjoy his character in Grand Torino. Um, well, and then, I mean, besides that, you got to look at the fact that, like uh, Jaybird said, Bridges of Madison County. Then you go to yeah. Unforgiven, and yeah. um, him and Solely, Morgan Freeman. Solely the Mule, I thought was great. Movies. Huh? The Mule. Oh, oh yeah. I didn't see that. One. That's actually the one I haven't seen. Well, and so. didn't, didn't he do like a couple of, like, um, uh, like, uh, oh, what am I, what am I trying to say? Like mystery thrillers, like uh, him and. Him and Jeff Daniels, um, where he lived oh, on a blood work. Blood work. Where he lived on the houseboat. That was good. Yeah. yeah. Where where the, and, the um, absolute power. Absolute I think power. He directed yep. With Gene and Hackman, then, I really yeah. He's got a, a long body of work that's just like, damn man, I got mad respect for you. He's just he's yeah. just good at what he does, and he's just but, quiet about it. You know, yep. Space Cowboys is another movie where it's not great by any stretch, but I really enjoy. Space was that nineteen ninety nine? Uh, that was 2000. Oh, darn it. Okay. And then, but then, like, when he did the back to back of Flags of Our Fathers and Letters from Iwo Jima, like, dude, oh, those, like, yeah. Flags of Our Fathers, I actually like that less than I liked Letters from Iwo Jima. Like, Interesting. And, and, but yeah, fantastic movie. Um, I didn't really care for Jersey Boys. Uh, didn't and see I that. think, I think oh, I liked Richard Jewell a lot. Uh, the 1517 to Paris. You didn't see that either. Yes. That one that one Richard. was interesting because they did they used the original guys that stopped that from yep. happening. Um 
which they're not actors so it didn't work as well as really? it could have if he would have gotten real actors to do that movie i will say the one reason why i'm very compelled to watch that movie other than the fact that those three guys are in it uh if i remember from the trailer right one of them is wearing a bayern munich jersey i think um, you're right and uh and bayern munich plays uh leo messi on friday in the champions league and that makes me uh excited gotcha um Ben Affleck is next on my list. Ben Affleck, like you, I can't. Richard Jewell, I thought was in, was incredible. Yeah, it was. And to know, to not know the full story, or at the point, you know what I mean. Like I remember him being accused. I remember him being uh, exonerated of it at some point, but I don't remember much else about it besides the bombing happening. And uh, to watch I that, I not heard about it. Dude, and Sam Rockwell's in that movie, so like you Sam might as Rockwell well go watch is... it because Sam Rockwell's in it. Period. So, but Sam dude, the, the 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 lead guy in that movie should have been nominated. He was that good. He was. He was fantastic. He was that... And he's a comedian. Like, if if you go and look at his like past, like that was the first like dramatic role he's ever had. He's done a bunch of comedies before that. I think someone said that he was he was in uh, what's that the 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 ice skater movie. Blades of Glory? Tanya Harding. Oh no! Oh, oh yes, yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, he yeah. was in that also. You're right. Yep. And so I had I hadn't seen that yet, but I like I like when I when you see an actor in a movie and you're not really familiar with the actor, and then they blow you away. There's no big backstory to them. That there's some flashy movie star, and they're in the role. It's just someone that's unknown, and to pull a performance off like that, I, I just I love that. Um, so he's moving, apparently in moving. Cobra Kai so uh, that's something that's on my list of I need to watch uh, he was also in Black Klansman um, trying to see uh, which I have not seen yet uh, yeah I haven't watched that yet either he was on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia he was on Community um, uh, a bunch of other dirt comedy Key and Peele episodes um, mm, okay. yeah like he, he came from a comedy background so for him to transition to play like that character, like I'm, I, I thought that was really well done by him. Um, and generally, comedians can do drama. That is true. Which brings me to Ben Affleck because he is a silly motherfucker. So like, <laughs> uh, I actually it really enjoy with Ben Affleck. Over here. Uh, I really think Ben Affleck is hilarious when he is being a comedy in a comedy. He has this, his facial expressions, his physicalness. It's just hilarious to me a lot of times. But from a dramatic standpoint, like um, Gone Baby Gone in the town, I, you know, Shane talked about it already. Like both of those movies, so well done. Amazing. Argo, while I don't, I didn't really like the ending of the movie. The uh, the rest of the movie itself is well done from beginning to end. Like you, I mean. I'm really shocked that he wasn't nominated for the best director, but he still won best picture for that one. It was very weird. Um, I didn't like, uh, uh, what was the last one, Shane? The way back. No, that wasn't. No, um, no. The one with Zoe Saldana where he plays the, he's the mobster. Oh, oh yeah. Um, Night. I, could, I rented, I rented that movie and I couldn't yeah. get into it. Yeah, we Shane and I watched it together, and it was very much a hard to finish yeah. movie because we were just like, "This is long. We're tired, and it's not entertaining enough." Um, did he so, direct that? Yeah, he did direct it. Yeah, he directed, he directed it. that one. Um, he wrote and directed it. Didn't he go into some depression after that or something? Uh, yeah, live, the, live by night. Live by night. Yeah. Live by night. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if that's when his alcoholism started again. Um, Moving on after that, though, is Spike Lee. We talked about him earlier. Fantastic. I like a lot of his movies. Um, Black Klansman is something that I keep meaning to find, and I keep forgetting to find it, uh, but it's high on my list. Uh, the last for my top 10 is is M. Night, is, uh, Shalomon, uh, Shyamalan. Uh, he's just, um, if one movie can make you, like you said earlier, it's The Sixth Sense, man. And don't get me wrong, like The Sixth Sense is a fantastic movie, but I actually really enjoy Unbreakable. I really enjoy Unbreakable. Um, great. 
um, uh, 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 oh God, I keep wanting to say break, but that's not right. Uh, it's not glass. It's the one that, it's split. Split. Oh, split, um, yeah. split was fantastic. The, and like the whole movie's good. And then the last sequence f does the M night thing and it turns it into a great movie for me. Sure. Um, so there is a whole lot. Um, a lot of people don't like signs. I like signs. I like signs. Here's let me, let me tell you my sign story real quick. Uh, signs I hated the very first time that I watched it, uh, but I hated it because I wanted an aliens movie. I thought I was going to watch an alien film. Watched it, absolutely hated it. A week later, uh, the girl I was dating at the time really wanted to go see Signs. I don't remember why. She really wanted to go see it, so I agreed to go with her to watch Signs a second time. Watching Signs a second time as a religious film made it a thousand times more enjoyable. Like, literally that tiny little aspect of, like, knowing the ending and knowing that it's not about aliens and knowing that it's all about God putting everything in the place that it's supposed to be for that final moment in the movie really enjoyed signs ever since that i just um, i i think that like the i liked overall love signs i'd watch i watch it repeatedly i liked it that much i still to this day think that the they could have sharpened it a bit with the whole when he went back and he was playing out his wife's death when mm -hmm. she was stuck between the cars or whatever and she was like swing away or whatever like that. Yep. And I just thought kind of like, and then like him putting that with taking the bat and swing and hitting the alien. I just thought that was kind of like a, out of, I don't know. It's almost well, kind of got, like, put it there been a, with, a, another different sign of something you, instead you've, of You've swing. got to put it together with the fact that swing away only worked because there was all those glasses of water around. Like if he had just been swinging the bat at nothing, it wouldn't have mattered, but because the daughter had to leave all those glasses of water around, that's what actually him swinging and shattering the glasses of water is what caused the alien to run away. I guess. Like I think it was just all, a it's, stretch. It's all about everything had, to, everything had to play out right and be put yeah. into a perfect position yeah. for that final scene to work. And the flashback to his wife was setting up the fact that as she was dying, she saw that moment and tried to give him the clues that led up to what we watched. Right. And, yeah. and it's pretty crazy. And he has made some duds. And uh, no After Earth, about Last that. Airbender, The Happening, Lady in the Water. Well, let I, me do, uh, let me just say real quick, I, the village... I like the village. I like the village too. Yeah. And I think I think the village you can take elements from that movie that apply today. I think a lot of parents who kind of um, shelter their children, shelter their kids yep. and, and keep them locked up and such, I think is very relative today. And I just remember like okay, it's a Shyamalan movie. What's the 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 the, the surprise going to be at the end? Mm -hmm. And I was just like you have got to be fucking kidding me yep. at that ending. And that was like one of the best endings ever on a movie. Cause you didn't really know what time period they were in. Yeah. No, like I, you I, know, I, I you just kind of went along. You just kind of went along with it and never thought of exactly, you know, my first it viewing, being I current thought it date. Was, yeah. My first viewing, I thought it was set in the 17, 1800s. Like I just assumed that's when the movie was set. So yeah, when she climbs that wall and there's a fucking car there, I I remember being like, wait, why, why is there what? a car? Wait a minute. Oh, oh, that's the twist. Is we're not in the 1800s. I uh, and, but, but why do people hate that movie? I don't. I don't. That's that was the last really good one he did, in my opinion. Although I want to ask, have either of you guys seen The Visit? You told yes. me I should watch it. The Visit was one of those ones I had such low expectations because Shyamalan had done so much crap. When I watched The Visit about the two kids that go visit their grandparents and a lot of weird stuff happens, the twist in that movie is really good. And and I I, I won't say the movie overall is like great or anything, but it, it has a lot of slow buildup. And then like the last 20 minutes, the twist happens. And and it's probably one of Shyamalan's best. It was one. Where but I, what I, what it did was it went it took him back to his old roots. Yes. 
after was, he had a, a kind of a, a few duds with the After yep. Earth and a few of the others and, and whatnot. So and, and, it's like, okay, he still got it in him, and then yep. he does Split. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is I really enjoyed Split. I liked Split as a movie. And then the the last scene happens where I find out that Split is in the same universe as Unbreakable, which I love Unbreakable. I, th- I think is one of his best movies also. I, I jumped out of my seat when I saw uh, Bruce Willis's character and was like, oh my God, they're connecting. Like, they're finally going to do, like, like, because Unbreakable was originally planned as a trilogy of movies. It sucks that Glass is what we got for the third part of that trilogy. Yeah. And we, I, liked, Glass, I liked Glass. I did not I did, like Glass. Yeah, I did not care for Glass. Uh, but I'll give you two people that are two other directors. Um, that, that were in my honorable mentions that popped into my head after I finished my top 10. Um, the Russo brothers, just because I, I want to see them do something that's not Marvel related. Cool. That's and you should watch they... Community, like I've told you for years, because they were very influential in creating Community and doing the entire first season of it. They've direct. I think they directed half the episodes in the first season. I already watched the first episode. I'll, maybe I'll get to the others. Who knows? Anyway, the Russo brothers, if they can direct something that's not Marvel related that I really enjoy, then they're probably going to break into my top ten easily. And then the other one is Peter Berg. Um, his like um, uh, Deepwater Horizon and um, hey, Lone Survivor. Lone Survivor, those two are his best work for me, for me personally. Um, but I really like almost everything that he's, uh, almost anything I've seen. I'll give him Spencer Confidential was really bad. Um, was that's it? on Netflix. Um, it, it, <laughs> it plays like a B movie, like a bad B movie that's made by A list people. So it doesn't make much sense to me at all. Um, but it definitely is one of those ones where you're just like, uh, like I wanted it to be better than it was. But uh, he did Patriots Day, which I thought was good. But I didn't, oh my uh, god, that movie was that had my adrenaline going. <laughs> so Dude, did you see Deepwater Horizon? Oh yeah, I thought that was great too. I, I've got oh. I own that. But I, Patriots Day, I just remember going to see it with Chris and Jenny. We went to the last show of the galaxy. We went to like a 10 o'clock, 1030 show as a long movie. And we were just, we were tired when we walked out of that movie because we were so exhausted from the adrenaline and the, the intensity of it and, and whatnot, you know? And then, um, I mean, and then also on his list, I mean, like battleships on his list, which, you know, everybody gets that dud or whatever. I got um, that. I own it. <laughs> but he directed uh, Hancock, which I think is just kind of okay. I really like The Kingdom. That's a that's the one with Jamie Lee Fox and Jennifer Gardner when they go. They're an FBI team that goes to like Iraq, I think, to investigate something. Uh, and Friday Night Lights, like how you like that movie is amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, yeah, Peter Berg and Russo, the Russo brothers are close to my top ten, but barely missed. Yeah, the Russo brothers directed 21 episodes of Community, and they they were like the founding fathers of Community. I, I I think you need to give more of season one a shot. The pilot is what, not the greatest. What sales did the, the Russo do? Uh, I I mean, other than that, it's Civil War, an, an episode of Agent Carter, Infinity War, Endgame. Um, oh, okay, okay. I needed to know what recently, what movies they did. Okay, yeah, they did the Avengers. Basically, okay. basically, ever since Winter Soldier, they took over the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They did Civil War. Jason Infinity just loves War, the Endgame. damn Avengers, is what he loves. <laughs> and Jaybird likes to turn his phone weird ways. <laughs> um, no, right. I'm not. My phone is still was still horizontal. Um, gotcha. MC, the MCU is a highlight man like it's one of the few things that comes out cinematically that most of the time they're gonna give me at least a seven out of ten movie uh if and that's like that's like that's like a mediocre uh, marvel movie for me is usually like six or seven on a scale of ten and then mo- a, a lot of them will exceed those for me personally well, but you know i, I am a comic book fan so i have a lot of respect for marvel but good 
God, if there's ever any silver lining out of this whole pandemic right now, uh-huh. it's to have a Marvel break. Okay. But I really want to see Black one. Widow, though. I don't know why you need one. If it's a good movie, I don't care. You feed no, me good movies it, all day just, long. If well, Star it's, Wars it's, was made well, you could have given me Star. You could have given me 20, 20 movies of Star Wars, just like you did Marvel. And I would have no problem with them. The problem no, is, no, it's kind of one of those things movies. where it's it's kind of like it was just getting to the point where you'd have two or three a year, and it's almost like even though they're different characters, then they come back with sequels. It's almost like giving it a little breather. It's like there's all of us this expectation of two or three Marvel movies a year, and it's just like it was kind of overkill. And I think it just it was, it's been a nice break. And then when it picks back up, it picks back up, and at least we'll go a year with just no Marvel movies. You know what I mean? Freaking a year and a half <laughs> yeah. before we get one. All well, right. good. That's longer. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move on to Brandon Yotter's list. We just spent a long time with Jason's list. Um, Brandon Yotter has Nolan, which we've talked about. Akira Kurosawa, which we mentioned. Uh, Ridley Scott has been talked about. Steven Spielberg appears again. Uh, Yotter has Wes Craven and John Carpenter also. Uh, Tim Burton's on there. Fincher is on there. Uh, we've talked about Tarantino and Scorsese. So uh, there's no surprises on Brandon Yotter's list. My only issue with that list, and we yep. didn't mention it earlier, was Tim Burton. Like, okay. I, like, I, I know some people who absolutely love him, and I, and I can't discount him being on a top ten list for anybody. But man, all of his movies look the same to me. Like, and all of them are are like the music's done by Danny Elfman. Yep. So like, I literally have been getting the same thing since 1989's Batman over and over and over and over again and it, like yeah to me like tim burton's just one of those things where like i i really enjoyed it when he went and did big fish instead yeah. of instead of something that was dark and needed like the johnny depp in a weird makeup outfit like but sorry so that's my only time but i did I, I, beetlejuice is his, beetlejuice is his stamp yeah totally oh and but um i i, I don't I even agree. think of that as being him I know yeah. it is him when I think of it, but when I but like you said that and I was like, oh yeah, duh, it's Beetlejuice. But like, well, it, I think a yes, lot of other people see Edward Scissorhands. But yeah, oh, like I, I hated but, Edward Scissorhands. I hated that movie at the time. To this <laughs> date, I still hate Edward Scissorhands, and it was just like I just didn't care about anybody in that. Oh, I just, I oh, it. <laughs> Tim Burton movies for me almost are kind of in that category of Wes Anderson and uh, the Coen brothers. They have that niche audience and there's just this offbeat kind of weird character mentality and everyone's just odd and you don't know if you really be friends with any of the characters and in, in his stories. And, and then like that whole Allison didn't Tim Burton do the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory thing? Yeah, he did Charlie okay. and the Chocolate yeah. Factory. That thing was like, I don't know how in the hell they that they thought that was going to appeal to kids. That thing was just weird. Yeah. It's a yeah. demonic movie, dude. Oh, it is. And then even like Alice in Wonderland, I'm like, how in the hell did this do three hundred million dollars? It just, it's boring. I know so many people who love Mars Attacks, and that's one of the worst movies for me. Oh, yeah. I, okay, I, I kind of like Mars Attacks. Um, and you know like, why? <laughs> but like, yeah, good point. Beetlejuice. I didn't even think about the fact. I never. It never occurs to me like that was his major breakout movie. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, Pee Wee. You also have Pee Wee's Big Adventure in there, right? So. Yep. So I don't know. I. I. I but yeah. And did did Tim Burton do the um the black and white movie with um Martin what's his name that won an Oscar or something like that? Uh, Martin Ed Wood. Yes. Yeah, he did Ed Wood. Uh, Martin Landau. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, another one that I didn't care for. So. Yeah. Uh, all right, jump into Jay Hampton's list. Um, I'm going to mention the people we've already talked about. John Carpenter, Steven Spielberg, Kevin Smith, Clint Eastwood, and Kurosawa. All great directors. 
Uh, Jay's got a couple on here that, that we haven't really talked about. Terry Gilliam, uh, Rob Reiner, Tony Scott, uh, Richard Linklater, and Guy Ritchie. Hey, Jay Hampton, is that the the Republican uh, rock dude? I, I don't think so. No. Who's the who's the who's the 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 the, the guy from back in the day that be in the movies and he's a pretty good actor. But he plays the guitar and he's a Republican. I don't know. Okay, I yep. take what sure. Jay Hampton was. I'm sorry. Nope. <laughs> Jay's just a drinking buddy of mine. He was on the 99 episode. Yeah, he was when we did soundtracks. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting him mixed in with the 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 rocker dude. Okay, who's an actor? Okay. <laughs> Gotcha. Nope, just a buddy, just drink a buddy of mine. Um, uh, I, I, I can't argue. I uh, Rob Reiner isn't uh, bringing a lot to my mind, but Tony Scott does good action movies. Guy Ritchie is a niche for me. Uh, Terry Gilliam's phenomenal. I love Brazil. It's, it didn't make my top ten list, but it'd probably be in like a top twenty five list of mine. Like Brazil is phenomenal. Twelve Monkeys is amazing. Uh, Richard Linklater, because of his influence on Kevin Smith, I've watched a lot of his stuff. Um, so yeah, solid directors. Uh, like I said, I can't really think of much Rob Reiner stuff off the top of my head. Well, Richard Link, I, I tell you what, that's pretty fucking incredible. I can't, I could not sit and watch Boyhood over and over, but okay. I have mad respect for the creativity of coming up with that idea to, to shoot it that's for seven pretty, years pretty freaking amazing like that's a pretty that is art right there that is great creative art okay rob reiner did spinal tap which is obviously amazing stand by me princess bride harry met sally misery few good men north american president i don't know why i the story of us i really like okay yeah rob reiner is a phenomenal director I don't know why he, I don't know he's why not on he, anybody okay. else's list no i'm pretty sure he's jay's the only one that came up with that and he has an amazing list of films. Yeah, he's got a good body of work. Yeah. Um, all right, let us jump next to uh, Brandon Simpson. We've touched on Kevin Smith. We've touched on Tarantino. We've touched on James Cameron. Uh, we touched on Spielberg. We've talked about Joss Whedon. Uh, we've briefly mentioned Ron Howard. We've talked about Wes Craven. We've talked about Chris Columbus. Uh, the two on Snow's list that stand out... Um, Ryan Coogler, who I believe has only directed three films, um, Amazing. and Luke Besson, Amazing. Um, who Luke Besson is another hit and miss for me because he's done a lot of really amazing stuff. And then um, when he makes the decision to remake his own French films as American films, uh, they really fail, in my opinion. Um, but, I, it's, but you look at you look at Luke Besson, and his first movie that I can remember is the is La Femme Nikita. La Femme Nikita. And he followed that with Prof the Professional. Yep. Which I love the Professional. Oh yeah. Um, I think it's better as the Professional and not Leon because oh, I, I like Leon, Leon a lot. Leon, the the aspect of them being in love more so than a father daughter relationship whoa, 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 is very whoa, 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 whoa. gross. There's to me. there's no aspect of them being in love. There is a there is a desire by Natalie Portman's character that he refuses to ever reciprocate. Oh, there's love there. He doesn't reciprocate it because he's not a pedophile, right. which I appreciate. Right. But the fact that he he is romantically in love with a girl who is that young is is really gross to me. Um, but I really love the professional. The professional's awesome. I like the extended aspects of Leon that don't involve their relationship. Sure. There's just um, a lot more training sequences and a lot more him teaching her how to be an assassin. Some of the some of the action sequences have uh, more violent and bloody stuff to them. Um, That's one I need to see again. It's been so forever since I've seen that. And the Fifth Element, like you Fifth can't really like, and and I know a lot of people who didn't care for it, and I and I truly mean this, that Valerian. A lot of people hated it. Uh, or thought it sucked. I, I I really enjoyed it. I must have been in the right mood to watch that movie, whatever the case. Um, but I will give it to you. There is a lot of stuff that he has done that just makes you go, "What the hell were you thinking, man?" Like, yeah, 
How do you make such Wes good Anderson. movies? Wes <laughs> Anderson. <laughs> in 1999, he did The Messenger, The Story of Joan of Arc. Not a good movie. Uh-uh. Cohen um, Brothers. <laughs> good point. Um, Ryan Coogler, he Ryan did Coogler. Black Panther, Creed, and Fruitvale Station. Fruitvale Station, yep. Uh, I I have to say that Creed was way, way better than I ever thought it was going to oh, be. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. That was one of those movies that when I watched it, I I actually talked about it. Character driven. Um, it was so, so well done. I, I love the girlfriend in the movie. Um who becomes his wife in the second film. Um, I thought uh, that the whole aspect there, and she's played by Teresa Thompson. Oh, okay. Like uh, she, it's just so, so good. And and you feel a whole lot during that film. Um, I've who never did seen the, Fruit. Who directed the second one? I don't remember. No I know he produced it, but I don't think he, di- he didn't direct it. He didn't direct it. it. Okay. Um, Fruitvale Station is something that I want to see. That's on another one on my list that I just haven't made the time to see it yet. But it's, it's something that I, I know from hearing. I, I also know how emotionally heavy that movie is. Yeah. So it's got to be something that I'm ready for and have to be ready to willing to sit down and deal with that. It's a so, really good movie, but it is really tough to watch in my eye. I had a hard time watching Fruitville Station. And then uh, Black Panther was, you know, I, I unfortunately it follows that the 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 thing that Jason was Jason was talking about earlier with Marvel movies, like and, and how it follows that exact same design as all the other Marvel origin films. Yep. Um, that's my only issue with Black Panther. It looks fantastic. Um, I think Chadwick Boseman's a little bit too wooden in that role, um, but I thought Michael B. Jordan was awesome, maybe yep. one of the best MCU uh, villains of all time. Um, but you know, it, it's a it's a good movie. It's not too much more than a middle of the pack for me personally, uh, from a story standpoint. But it looks fantastic. Sure. So, uh, all right, we're gonna jump on to my buddy Steve Wilhammer's list. Uh, we've talked about Tarantino, we've talked about Spielberg, we've talked about Hitchcock, uh, we talked about Kubrick, we talked about Nolan, uh, we talked about Tim Burton, we talked about Scorsese, we talked about Ridley Scott, we talked about Zemeckis. He has Ethan Cohen down. I'm pretty sure that's just the Cohen brothers, as it, I don't know if they've directed anything apart. I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I just know them as the Cohen brothers. So, pretty pretty solid list of people we've already talked about with Steve um dave sibley is dave sibley's our curveball and i knew he was going to be good for a, a curveball list uh, so is dave, he our castleton arts he's list? our castle he's our castleton arts list like along dave, with tim pendleton huh yeah dave dave's list uh kurosawa spielberg scorsese uh kubrick spike lee and terry gilliam all all very good um I'm happy to finally see Edgar Wright show up on somebody's list. I really enjoy Edgar Wright movies. Yeah. Um, then he put in Hayao Miyazaki, which I enjoy most of the Miyazaki stuff I've watched. I know the Weinstein. It's beautiful. Is, I know Weinstein is a bad word, but I was only ever introduced to Miyazaki because Weinstein bought the rights to all of his movies and then re-English dubbed them um, in the late '90s into the early 2000s. So like Mononoke, um, Howl's Moving Castle, and uh, Spirit Ponyo. of the Way, Ponyo, like those those were those were when I was introduced to Miyazaki and I loved all. I think they're very beautiful movies, uh, very good stories. Um, he has Terry Gilliam on his list. He has Terrence Malick on his list. Oh, and he has Ayaso Takahata, who I've never heard of. And I had to look up, and he is a huge uh, anime. Like, I, I didn't see any live-action movies on his list, um, but apparently in the 70s he did Japanese versions of Heidi and Anne of Green Gables that were really popular. Um, but yeah, he, How he anybody has... likes Terrence Malick is so beyond me. I have never watched any of his movies and enjoyed any aspect of them. I'm I bored agree. out of my I mind. Think they're, they're, I they're, they're, they're beautiful, like scenery wise, they're beautiful, but it's just like, it's like you're on crack or something, man. Like, it's I, just I, like, I, give me a screwdriver and a joint, like, so I can get <laughs> through this. I appreciate Tree of Life 
for the story it tells, but I also feel like an hour of it could have been cut out, and I would have really liked the movie. Like, there, there's just so much stuff in Tree of Life that doesn't matter, in my opinion, to the story it's telling. Like, the 20-minute creation of the Earth at the, at, like, the beginning of the movie just it like looked cool but it it really made no point to the actual like plot of I feel of like kid growing Terrence up. Malick I feel like Terrence Malick movies just take themselves so fucking seriously it's like come on what was his what was his only like real attempt at a narrative movie it was in the 90s the thin red line yes that's what i was thinking of yeah thin red and line and even even that was like just yeah dude and it has an amazing cast it's one of those movies Dude, where you, I watch the cast. Jason, do you know how many movies have amazing cast and the movies right. suck? <laughs> but, but, we were, but seriously, I remember working at Clearwater. I'm pretty sure I was working at Clearwater, or at least I was seeing all the movies there. Anyway. Thin Red Line was 98. Okay, so yeah, I was working there, and I remember seeing that trailer on so many different things, and I was like, dude, look at this cast. I'm all for this. I am pumped to watch this movie. And then I was watching it, and I was like, what is going on? <laughs> like, I am completely bored out of my brain here. Like, like I am uh, tired of all these actors that compile into this movie because of the director that they're working with. So they all just take a part in a movie and the fucking movie minuscule. is just like whatever. Yeah, like John uh, John Travolta's in it for what? Like 30 seconds or something? And he's getting a billing? Like, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, that that was that was our Castleton Arts entry for tonight. Uh, not not a bad list, but uh, definitely stuff on there that I'm not familiar with. Um, my buddy Brian Mazurkowitz. Uh, there's a couple on here we haven't addressed, so I'll just start with Kevin Smith, Steven Spielberg, John Hughes, Quentin Tarantino, uh, Joss Whedon, John Favreau, uh, Carl Reiner. I think that's the only person who actually put Favreau on their list, right? Or is that the second one? Oh, it may have been the second. Um, I think that's I the first. It may, I think it may that's be, the first. The second person might be later, but yeah, Favreau, uh, I guess we talked about, I, get, I can't remember, I remember talking about Chef earlier, but like Chef is a phenomenal movie. Um, I was talking about how like I want I wanted to put him on my list. Oh, okay, that's what. It, yeah. So yeah, Favreau so, does have a really good list. Like Elf, I really enjoy. Like yeah, I, I think Favreau is a really good director. He does fun movies that I enjoy. Did, didn't care for his Jungle Book or his Lion King. Yeah, oh. and and I I didn't watch either of those. I'm sorry, I didn't watch the Lion King, and I didn't care for it. That's why I didn't watch Jungle Book. Um, yeah, his yeah. Uh, but we do have the first and only person to put George Lucas on their list. He's directed what five movies? Remember, it only takes one, Jason. Amer- <laughs> well, but it would have true. to be either A New Hope or American Graffiti. Okay, so I'm sorry, six movies, six movies, because he did, uh, he did all, he did the three prequels. He did A New Hope. Yep. He did uh, Howard the Duck. Yep. And American Graffiti. American Graffiti. I think that's it. I think he did six movies. But you're right. It, it only it takes, takes one. one movie. It takes one but which, movie. But if which may, one of those it changes would it your be? life. It has to but, be. But, you know, movie. people love Attack of the Clones. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Nobody that I know. That's called exaggeration, okay. Jen. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, like, THX. Oh, yeah. THX 1138. Yeah. Um, oh. so yeah, uh, and then another person on here, uh, was Ivan Reitman. You know what? He, he's, he's he was big movies. in the eighties, man. Like Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters Legal Eagles. Um, what else did he do? He did so, so many other movies. Um, 19 movies. Didn't he do like Belushi movies or something? Or is that John Landis? That's John uh, I think Landis. That John Landis did a lot of the. Well, what else? Re- read it off, Shane. I know you got your your data there. Uh, for which one? For for who? Ivan, Ivan Reitman. Oh, Ivan. Uh, give me just a second, Jason. Did Legal you say Eagles? Lucas has done nineteen directorial directorial. Dude, yeah. When you look it up on the IMDb, it gives you a list of like all of his shorts he ever did. Okay. And it also gives you a list of like 
Star Wars: The Deleted Scenes. It's like yes, uh, well, we, no. It's the six. We don't have time we for that. About. We just, just All right, get so here we go. Movies. Here we go. Here we go. Here's here's our Ivan Reitman list, which is a lot better than I expected. To be honest, I, there's a couple on here I didn't realize were him. Uh, meatballs, meat, meatballs, stripes, Ghostbusters, Legal Eagles, Twins, great movie, Ghostbusters Two, Kindergarten Cop, Dave. Unfortunately, he did Junior. Uh, six <laughs> days, se- six days, seven nights. Evolution. Um, draft. Okay, it started draft getting bad. Day was him. Then. Yeah, my super ex girlfriend. After Evolution, he did my super ex girlfriend. And no, no strings, strings attached. attached. And draft day. Yeah. So yes. Like who who directed? Guys. Um, who directed my stepmother's an alien? Uh, that's a funny one. Yeah, I don't remember who directed it though. So wait a second. So if Ivan Reitman did Stripes, I thought Harold Ramis directed Stripes. So what did Harold Ramis direct? Caddyshack? Uh, I believe he did Caddyshack. Give me just a second. I'll pull up Ramis. Well, what else did it? Richard Harold, Benjamin Harold did Ramis my and Ivan Reitman. I get confused on the directing because they were buddies. Very yeah, they were very similar in their style also. Richard Benjamin is the one who directed My Stepmother is an Alien, which had Allison Hannigan in it. Wow. Interesting. I did not know that. Uh, so so Harold Ramis' list was Caddyshack, Vacation, Groundhog Day, Multiplicity, Analyze This and That, and Bedazzled. Okay, so we, okay, we did talk. I just, yeah. oh my God. I was getting Ivan Reitman. Okay, got it. Got yep. it. Got it. Yeah, they're two. They're similar. Very similar, yep. Uh, and then Carl Reiner was the last one on Brian's list that uh, obviously from a comedic standpoint, you've got the jerk, Den- Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, The Man with Two Brains, Summer School, Fatal Instinct. Like, definitely definitely lots of various attempts at comedy for, for Carl Reiner. Fatal Instinct is so bad, it's yes, good. It is. It's, a, it's a terrible, but I love this. In the same way that I like uh, National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon 1. Oh, like, the satire is yes, just... Yes, the satire in Fatal the, Instinct the, the, is the, so the, good. The, the scene where she's got the smoke and she's blowing the smoke. <laughs> and it's just... <laughs> yes. It was perfect. I loved it. I loved it. And was there a... Um, did she do like a beaver shot, like with the basic instinct? Was there some kind of a? That was loaded did weapon. They make one. fun of that. That was loaded weapon one, where she she does the leg spread, and there's an actual legit beaver in her in her dress. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's a chair. It's sitting in the chair. It takes her spot completely. Oh yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Because it says gratuitous beaver shot. So that's that's Emilio Estevez and Sam Jackson, right? Yep. Bruce oh Willis God. has Sam a cameo Jackson's in it. Every freaking thing. <laughs> All right, moving on uh, to my buddy Steve's list. Steve's got some interesting stuff on here for us to talk about. Uh, first off, Quentin Tarantino, Alfred Hitchcock, J.J. Abrams, Chris Nolan, Scorsese, uh, Ridley Scott, Ron Howard. Uh, he's the first person I remember mentioning Guy Ritchie. Or did we talk about Guy Ritchie? No. 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 So you got Snatch, Lockstock, a lot of good British uh, stuff in there. Um, but Sherlock has, Holmes. Yeah, not a fan. Um, he has he has two directors on here that I had to look up because they're they're strictly television directors. And people, isn't one of them do like Game of Thrones or something? Yep. Uh, so yeah. so his first one's a guy named Phil Abraham. Uh, he's done the TV. Uh, this is the list of TV shows that I care about that he did: The Killing, Master of Sex, Mad Men, Bosch, Ray Donovan, Luke Cage, Bates Motel, The Defenders, Ozark, Daredevil, Orange Is the New Black, Glow, Castle Rock, Jack Ryan. Like, there's a lot of HBO. There's a lot of Netflix. There's a lot of Hulu on this guy's list. Um, the second director that he's got is a guy named Tim Van Patten who originally started on Touched by an Angel. Then he went on to do Ed, which is a phenomenal series. Then he did Sex in the City, The Wire, Deadwood, Rome, Sopranos, Game of Thrones. That's a lot of HBO for him right there. Uh, he did the Black Mirror episode called Hang the DJ, which is one of the best Black Mirror episodes there is. And right now the guy is directing Perry Mason episodes. So, like, it... it when I had to look those two directors up and I saw these are very strictly television directors, 
it was the first time I ever considered like, I mean, I know like guys like Joss Whedon directed an episode here and there when they're like launching shows or like, I know Favreau's directed some pilot episodes of stuff. Um, the Russo brothers. The Russo brothers with community. But it's like when I, when, when Jason threw this out there for directors, I, I was thinking movies, not TV. Thought of movies, but I mean, with the way with the way society is these days, and with the fact that personally I believe television is far superior to what we get in film, it doesn't surprise me that there would be somebody who had a good list of directors out there. Um, yeah. So that was really cool to see. That's to, it was really cool to see. That's how Steve's brain thought about directors. Um, and then the last one that was on his list uh, was was Guy Ritchie, which we basically just touched on. Um, moving on to Chris Meek's list. Uh, Tarantino, Scorsese, Ron Howard, Spielberg, Shyamalan, uh, Christopher Guest is one we haven't talked about yet, as is uh, Robert Rodriguez. Uh, Robert yeah. Rodriguez is one of those ones that uh, does so much with so little. Yep. Uh, we, well, we're, I can't remember who we were talking about earlier today. John Carpenter. That's yep. who we were talking about. So, uh, but like Robert Rodriguez, I feel like is like the new John Carpenter. It's like he can get so much more out of the money that he's given just because he's done almost everything behind the scenes that he, like when he was making Desperado and everything, that it makes perfect sense that like, I mean, I don't think Robert Rodriguez's is directing is anything that makes me think of him as a great director. Okay. But uh, but I I mean, if he's on somebody's list, obviously he's making an impact for that person. For sure. So. Spy Kids, man. Um, Spy Kids. <laughs> <laughs> I keep forgetting he did that in Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Shark Boy like, and Lava Girl. One of those moments where I'm like, Alita, like Death Pro- or Planet Terror. Yep. His, his Desperado trilogy, his uh, the Once Upon a t- uh, not Once Upon a Time, um, From Dusk Till Dawn. The Faculty. Like, oh yeah, good point. The Faculty. I love that yeah. movie. So like, I totally can see how it speaks to somebody. December of 1998, uh, Christmas Day, close enough to 1999. <laughs> it kind of gets put in there with the great movies of 90. It was in theaters no. in 99. No, um, not allowed. Kevin Smith was Quentin Tarantino on this person's list. Uh, Quentin yes. Tarantino was, yes. Hey, I got to give a shout out to uh, Death Proof uh, because that movie, again, such a throwback uh, to older films and kind of exploit. What do you call it? Exploited. Exploitation films. Exploitation, exploitation films. And um, it's a little disturbing to watch in scenes. Sure. Where he's the beating the shit out of her in the car. Sure. But God, I just love that movie though. It's 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 classic Quentin Tarantino where it's a lot of dialogue and then some graphic violence. Um, which I have I, I think it's a fine movie. I wish they would have flipped them on Correct. the double feature. Correct. Because I think um, Death Proof is slower of a film. Whereas uh, Planet Terror is definitely faster moving. Yep. So <laughs> it might have had to do with the fact that I didn't get to start it until like midnight and it was like a three hour thing or yep. whatever. But yeah, like it was one of those moments of like, oh man, like I'm so tired while I'm watching this Quentin Tarantino film. Agreed. I'm 100% so. like giving me an hour and a half of, of Robert Rodriguez like violence and whatnot. And then making me sit and listen to Quentin Tarantino dialogue for an hour before I get any action. Flipping those would have started me off really chill. Lots of good Tarantino dialogue, like the opening of Reservoir Dogs. You're just kind of building me up to what's going to happen. Give me that last 20 to 30 minutes of action in Death Proof, and then just go into the insanity of Planet Terror. Like, that would have played so much better. So, um, And then finally, we've got Mel Brooks on here. Um, Blazing Saddle, Young Frankenstein, History of the World, Spaceballs, uh, Robin Hood, Men in Tights, and Dracula Dead and Loving It. Decent, decent comedic resume there. I, I can't yeah. argue with anything. That's like the what? The second time he's come up tonight? Him and oh, Tim. is it? Okay, yeah. So, yeah. You don't see um, those types of movies anymore. You don't. You can't. And you, You're yeah, not you, allowed to. You can't make Blazing Saddles in this society. Like, un- unfortunately, like, 
I'm surprised that movie hasn't been blacklisted yet for half the jokes that are in there. But I mean, like, even like, you know, Fatal Instinct or Naked Gun, you just don't see that satire anymore. No. Uh, uh, it, it comes in waves. I mean, you think about it, it was big in the 80s for a while there, and then it died. No, but I'm saying today, like, we saw it in the early to mid 2000s with when they were making fun of the horror movies sure the scary, scary movie scary, with scary movie series not and stuff like that movie. not another teen movie and date uh, movie yep, and... Date night, but think of movie. think of think of how long it's been since we've had one of those types of movies but think over the last 10 years the movies that have come out that they can make fun of at this one yeah uh moving on to our last list we got to get through uh wes craven steven spielberg who gave you this list? Uh, Evan Miller. Sorry, this is Evan Miller's list. Uh, Wes Craven, Steven Spielberg, Taika Waititi, the Russo brothers are mentioned again. Uh, Michael Bay is mentioned again, but I don't think he's joking. Uh, Kevin Smith, James Gunn, J.J. Abrams. Here's the second list with Favreau. Uh, and then first time seeing James Wan on a list. Um which okay. getting getting to know Evan as well as I have the last month or so, uh, our love of horror movies makes a lot of sense that James Wan would be on his list. Um, yep. In the same way that you know Wes Craven's on his list, I'm surprised that John Carpenter's not on here. Um, I don't know if if that is in like a top twenty for Evan or whatnot, but um, personally, I'm not a fan of. As we've talked on the on the horror episode last week, I'm not a fan of like Dead Silence or Insidious or The Conjuring. Don't really care for those movies. I do. I do love the Saw franchise. Uh, I liked Furious Seven, uh, and I, I did enjoy Aquaman for what it was, which was just a, a dumb action movie. But um, yeah. James Wan's kind of all over the place for me. But like I said, he's done more in the horror genre that I don't care about. That I would never put him as like a favorite horror director of mine. How can you not like the Conjuring movies? They're just dumb. I don't. I don't enjoy horror that has no real purpose. Like. I, I don't enjoy alien or not alien uh extra um uh, ghosts ghosts and spirits horror isn't the kind of horror that I enjoy. Michael Myers chasing people, Freddy chasing people, Jason chasing people. Like I'm much more of a slasher. There's actually a killer with a purpose than it's But you're doing ghosts. a podcast next week on ghosts. Yeah, and we'll see how that goes. But there's also a bunch of comedic ghosts in there also. Um mm-hmm. So, yeah, James Wan, very interesting. This, it's the first time JJ's shown up on somebody's list. Oh, good call. I mentioned him as a possibility, oh, but okay. it's the first time he's shown up on an and the Russo list. brothers. Yep. So, um, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very solid list, kind of. I, I, I would be curious hearing from Evan exactly other than the movies. I, I, I'm wondering if he made Evan's list based on the same movies that I talked about or if Evan actually likes other movies that Michael Bay has done. Um, so that brings us to our, our final tally of, of who uh, our best loved directors are. We had 17 <laughs> lists that we just went through. Steven Spielberg showed up on 15 of them. I was one of the people that he was not on their list. So that's kind of awkward. I do love Steven Spielberg. There's just other directors that I enjoy. I enjoy their work better. Quentin Tarantino. So he gets the he gets the award. Yeah, he gets the award for best dire, best loved director uh, yep. out of everybody. Next up is Quentin Tarantino with eleven votes. Christopher Nolan had eight votes. Kevin Smith also had eight votes. Martin Scorsese had seven. John Hughes had six. Alfred Hitchcock and Wes Craven both had five. Uh, Akira Kurosawa, John Carpenter, Ridley Scott, Ron Howard, and Tim Burton all ended up with four votes each. So, so we ended up with the top 13. So we ended up with the top 13 because of how many were tied at four votes. But Steven Spielberg apparently is the director that uh, of everybody who responded to the to Jason's question. That's uh, that's everybody's favorite director. Which he has a good body. Which does not surprise me. Nope. Well, I mean, you think about. uh, I mean, he's pretty timeless, and I I mean, I would only say that he's starting to slow down now, like for the most part, because I mean, everything else that he, you know, a a lot of the movies that he's done 
have shaped so many people since the 70s so for sure like, well and i feel like some of his stuff like um kingdom of the crystal skull like i don't understand his logic for going back and doing that like i don't know if that was a cash grab for him or whatnot but like war of the worlds didn't really care for that um but dude he also didn't catch me if you can like which is so so good um yeah like he he really does have like an insanely long solid list i love hook i know jason doesn't like hook but I it's love not as bad it. as I remember it. Thank God that you finally caught on to that. It's boy, so much fun. Boy, you could tell that shit was on, filmed on set sets. I mean, <laughs> they, you're not wrong about that, but the, I think that's part of the nostalgia for it. The, for me the also. fairy tale aspect. Yeah, of it, yeah. like it, it's 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 supposed to be Never Never Land, and and it's it's not supposed to be a well, real. Well, how place. the hell is that movie a hundred million dollar budget? Uh, they had oh, to they build all salaries. those sets. Um, yeah, that's, that's how the the sets alone probably cost know, them most of that. Spielberg did um didn't he do like the the ten 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 movie and War Horse too? He did War Horse. The Adventures um, of Ten Ten, the cartoon. Oh animated. yeah, the Adventures of Ten Ten and War Horse. Yep. Ten Ten. Yes. Yes. Yep, yep. Um, but I mean, like Saving Private Ryan, um, Schindler's Munich. List, Jurassic Park, Jaws, um, Jaws. The original trilogy of Indiana Jones. E.T. Uh, yeah, Close like, Encounters. See, that's what I would love. I think, and in, in, in I'll, I'll have to watch it, but it still didn't tap into. I want Steven Spielberg to go back to his late 70s, 80s and tap back into that. Okay. I don't know what the story needs to be, whatever. He'll, he could figure something out, but go back to the, I mean, you think about Jaws, E.T., Raiders of the Lost Ark, Close Encounters, all in that late 70s, early 80s period. And those are just Jurassic just Park. Phenomenal story. What'd you say? Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I I I I'll give you Jurassic Park. But tap back into that. You know what I mean? So if you look at Jaws, E.T., Close Encounters, Raiders jump to jurassic park there's just something special about those films and because spielberg got serious for a while oh yeah yeah definitely. like a dark tone like Stephen, what you doing directing r-rated movies like <laughs> um like like munich was munich? dark yep oh dude that, that i don't care for that movie it was a little bit too dark for me so uh, i know i have been very critical of ready player one uh, but I do highly recommend that you watch it. Um, oh, I will. I my, will. My critical aspects of it are based on my my absolute love and passion that the book is the best book I have ever read in my life, and the movie shares ten percent of the story that's actually in the book. Um, yep. But visually, and for somebody who hasn't read the book, I understand why they would like the movie. It does have a lot of nostalgia going for it, um, and and they they do some things well in the movie. Uh, Mayor, I'm curious if you're excited for his version of West Side Story. Uh, I don't think it needed to be redone. Okay. Um, my problem with West Side Story is it's very... It's one of my least favorite uh, musicals that everybody loves. And okay. I don't understand why. It's got three good songs, in my opinion. Um, a lot of it's just... It, uh, for the time frame that it came out I could see how it'd be revolutionary like uh, kind of like how you know um, a Citizen Kane was um, for a movie making West Side Story when it came out on for a musical definitely probably was uh, something that so many people had never seen because it was it's a huge cast um, uh, but like I really I um uh, I'm excited the, to see it. Uh, I mean, I'll I'll watch it, but like Feel America, hard. America's uh, is the best song in the show. Um, I've thought that the when I watched the movie version, I've seen it live, uh, done in uh, done in theater, and I thought the same thing there. It's like America's the best thing. Um, Tonight is a really good ballad, and then um, um. Oh my gosh, uh, Maria! Like Maria is a great song too. So like, but uh, for the most part, I think it's just bland. 
I'm hoping that Steven Spielberg can give it some kind of new life that I enjoy it more than I've ever done. Um, and, and that's a hope. I don't think it's going to happen, but if it does, then I'm going to be happy to be like, dude, he, he made a really good version of this. Um, I know that a whole lot of people probably think that it's absolutely disgusting that he's remaking the movie because so many people love the original version. Um, and it won so many Academy Awards. And I know, and uh, especially somebody being, being a musical fan and knowing people that are directors and everything else that love that movie. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he can do a good job. But if anybody can, hopefully it's Spielberg. He knows how to ride that line when he wants to do something that everybody will enjoy. Um, but it's exciting so. with the fact that like it's Spielberg and a musical. Yeah, don't hurt me. That we've not seen this before. So and, and I'm and I'm all for it. I just hope that he knocks it out of the ballpark compares to just oh you know, sure. I just hope he doesn't do something that's just kind of mediocre. I mean, we were talking about Spielberg, and I'm like, dude, this is the guy who did mediocre. Minority Report, like, like, and I love Minority Report. Yeah. So what was that, Jaybird? I was like, Speed Spielberg does not do mediocre. Uh, he doesn't do mediocre, but sometimes it happens <laughs> to his movies. Okay, so what? 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 Okay, real quick. I don't want to drag this out. What? Real quick. What? What, what movie is mediocre for Spielberg? Uh, let me pull up his list for you. It's right here. No, you should be able to pull that out your ass right now. Well, here's the other thing: is like there's there's so many that I love. Like Bridges, of, Bridge of Spies is something I absolutely adore and thought the, it was amazing. The Terminal Chris, is blah. War of the Worlds is blah. AI Crystal Skull is, is crap. AI is blah. A, yeah, AI is definitely blah. Um, I've never seen Bridge of Spies. Lost World was blah. We didn't uh, say blah. We said mediocre. Th that's okay, what I I'll mean say by mediocre. blah. Lost World is mediocre. Okay, I'll give you that. Um, so, I'm not a huge fan of E.T. Oh, I can't agree with that. I know a lot of people love it, but I, I boy, I just boy, bye, okay. bye, bye, <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs> oh, as 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 we are gonna wrap up, Jason, well, you just say... lost your movie card for life, oh. dude. Bye. I'm not lying to you. I have not seen that movie in 30 years. Easy. Show, Show your kids. kids and watch Show it with kids. them. I own the movie. I am attempting to try and get that. It was on the list of. Uh, uh, of trying to get the kids to watch it outdoors last weekend, nice. and they they got rid of that one, and they ended up picking um, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Yep. Harry Potter too, and that was kind of for my wife more so than anybody else. But uh, oh no, you need to you need but, to get the kids no, to watch ET on yeah, the, but, the, the 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 garage door. So yeah, <laughs> like I, it's definitely I, like Hook. I I hated Hook when I was growing up. I thought it was a really bad movie. I watched it again recently with my kids. Peter Pan is my all-time favorite Disney movie. Oh. I love the aspect of Peter Pan. Finding Neverland is could have easily been in my top 10 movies of all time. Um, the Johnny Depp so movie? Oh, yeah, dude. I, oh. That movie is amazing. Um, but Peter Pan's ingrained in everybody, in my opinion, of this uh, innate wanting to just be a child forever. And uh, so Hook, I gave it another chance and I, I liked it way more than I thought I was going to. So I'm hoping that I'm right with her. I'm hoping that I get the same effect when I watch E.T. with my kids. So so the last thing I'm going to say as we wrap up and, and finish this episode is I was unaware of the fact that Steven Spielberg in 1971 directed an episode of Columbo. What? To have Steven Spielberg and Peter Falk working together is something I would have loved to have seen. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, you think about it too. Stevie or uh, Steven Spielberg directed Goldie Hawn. That sounds weird, doesn't it? In what? In what? Sugarland Express. Oh, I've never oh, seen that... it. Yeah. That was before Jaws. But it's just fear it's weird to put Steven Spielberg with Goldie Hawn. Sure. Uh, like, so what? I appreciate you guys being on here with me tonight. We actually had nine less lists to go through, and we somehow talked for like 40 minutes longer than our top 10 list. But uh, I feel like we had a great chat about a lot of directors. I appreciate you guys' this time. Uh, next week's episode, episode 13, is going to be called 13 Ghosts. Right now on the Shane Talks uh, Facebook page, there is a list of 
I think it's up to like 30 ghosts in movies now. Uh, you can vote for as many of the ghosts that you like. Uh, the top 13 of them we're going to discuss on next week's episode. Um, and if both of you guys want to come back next week, that's cool with me. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys for your time tonight. <laughs>